Let's see. Got uh, I've got a microphone. Somewhere here, I think I have a microscope. I've got my camera hooked up. We'll just go ahead and start, I think. Let's see. Yeah, you can see me, I suspect. Hi. It's probably been like, I don't know, three weeks since I've done a night stream. It's been a while. But, uh... I got myself some chai tea and uh, I got myself some diatom slides and uh, we could look around a little in them, you know, for funsies. This is not the Gonfo monster, Rihanna. This is a Simbella in the uh, group Mexicana. I don't think it's actually the nominate variety, but it's uh, in that group. You can tell because it has this, uh, oh yeah, I can do this, I forgot. Zoomies, zoomies? Let's zoom into that little area right there. You can tell because it has this, uh, see how the stri look like little blocks? And uh, all the way through it, and right in the center, there's a, um, it's kind of hard to get it to stay still. There's a stigmoid right there in between the, um, the proximal ends of the raphe. So we're, we're zoomed in pretty close. We could get closer. Um, so you can see those structures. That's pretty common for the Mexicana group to have that little dot there in the middle. And those, um, uh, the areoli on the stri are those sort of blocky shapes. So let's see if I can make this go away. Yeah, so for now I've got the box. Well, I think it'll fade. Um, then all around it, are some more little diatoms. Why isn't that fading? Well, we might have a box for a while. Uh, I think those are probably denticula. Even though when I talked to Anna, she said she didn't think that, um, that there was denticula in the sample. I'm pretty sure those are denticulas. I guess they could be the denticula-like naviculoids. Fibot says, what's that brown bacteria-looking thingy? Mm, this one? This thing? Right here? I don't know. Um, probably a bit of plant material. Um, it's not bacteria, that's for sure. Uh, but it might have some bacteria on it. The um, these samples, I thought they'd been processed, but they actually haven't been processed at all. And so there's still a bunch of the organic material present in them, which is kind of funny because we put it on the SEM and I, I noticed that there were a lot of colonies that were still sort of attached and that the uh, many of the diatoms were sort of in their life position. Um, and I saw a bunch of organic debris on the slides, and I thought, well, whoever processed this, they must not have done a very good job. So you see those, um, do you see those uh, sort of on the top of those things, there's a um, sort of bubbly shapes and then uh, dark lines between them. The dark lines are costy, and the bubbly shapes are called, um, well, they're the, uh, they're sort of like an open structure on the top of those things. And um, like if we saw this in a scanning electron microscope, the dark lines would be sort of pieces of silica that attached to the valve face. So um, Ribozoid asked, how do I process them? So most of the time for diatom samples, we can 
you know, you can see diatoms if you just take a piece of mud and, uh, and smear it on a piece of a cover slip and then um, put some a little bit of water on it and stick it in um, on a slide glass. But the, um, the organic matter that's in the slide kind of gets in the way of everything. And we don't want that. Uh, so the little bits of mud and everything else are mostly made out of, of organic matter that we're trying to get rid of so that we can see things like the diatoms more clearly. So um, in order to do that, normally in my lab, uh, we have sort of a low, um, low intensity type of processing that we use where we put hydrogen peroxide in the sample um, not the kind that you buy at the grocery store, that's typically 3%, but um, 10 times more concentrated to that. So usually in the sort of 30 or 35% hydrogen peroxide. And um, that's an oxidizer. So the general idea of an oxidizer, uh, oxidizer is hydrogen peroxide has the chemical formula H2O2, which means that there's two hydrogen, two oxygen together. But you'll probably think, oh, that sounds really familiar. It's kind of close to water, which is H2O. And in fact, if you just leave hydrogen peroxide um, out in a glass on a table, what will happen is um, some of the oxygen will escape and uh, it'll just turn into water, which is why usually it's kept in sort of a brown bottle and kept in a refrigerator so that it doesn't basically lose any of its potency. And, um, and so... Uh, but what that means is that hydrogen peroxide wants to donate an oxygen to something, and in our samples, it finds a uh, reliable um, place to put that oxygen because there's carbon everywhere in the mud. And so what it does is it hands off oxygen to the carbon, which is um, looking for something to attach to, and that creates carbon monoxide, CO, and then usually it gives it another oxygen and it turns into carbon dioxide. And so um, you'll note that carbon dioxide is a gas, whereas carbon is typically a solid. And so what it does is basically oxidize out all of the organic matter. And what you're left with is nothing, gas, right? So uh, it donates an oxygen, turns it into gas basically. And so um, we put those in a hood and we do that so that we don't have excess amounts of carbon dioxide in our lab. It's not generating so much that we would probably pass out. It's not like um, dry ice, which generates a lot of carbon dioxide, but uh, you know when it vaporizes. Um, but the uh, the process basically gets rid of all the carbon in the sample, and or, or most of it, and we just leave it like that um, in a hood sitting. Sometimes the samples will get really hot because the process of donating oxygen to carbon and turning from um, a solid to a gas actually generates heat. And so if a lot of that processing starts to happen, if there's a lot of organic matter in the sample, what will happen is it will start to get warmer. And most kind of chemical reactions, when it gets warmer, speed up. So the process is like um, it gets a little warm from donating oxygen and then um, that process then sort of runs away eventually because as, ex as the exothermic reaction occurs, basically it keeps generating more and more heat, which then speeds up the reaction, which means it generates oxygen um, and contributes oxygen more readily, and so oxidizes more stuff and gets hotter. And so, um, yeah, the nitric acid will also make it hot because nitric acid also donates oxygen and um, basically does the same process. Hey, Pacific Plankton, how are you doing? Um, so that process basically ends up with um, all of the carbon, or at least in theory, all the carbon getting out of the sample. And um, the nitric acid is sort of just a, a more intense, um, harsh way of doing exactly the same thing. Um, but normally with nitric acid, we also will continually sort of speed up the reaction. Oh, there's a big storm there. Um, We'll put it on a hot plate in a glass vial with nitric acid and uh, and let it sit like that for a couple of hours and that basically will, will get rid of almost all of the organic matter um, in the sample so the hydrogen peroxide process usually takes something like um, 
I don't know, if, if the reaction's happening very quickly, it could be over in a matter of hours. But we usually just let it sit in like at room temperature and go through the digestion process or oxidizing the carbon. Um, I usually just let it happen for weeks, um, sometimes two or three weeks. We'll just come back, uh, especially if we have a lot of, if there's a lot of samples, then um, we'll, we'll just do them all at once and then uh, and let them sit and come back in like three weeks and then rinse out all of the um, supernatant fluid. So by adding water and then basically um, using a vacuum line hooked up to a sink, we'll suck out all of the uh, nasty stuff and leave just the residue behind. And in that residue would basically be anything in the sample that's not carbon. And for us, that's what we want because it leaves just the silica behind. So um, the nitric processing usually happens over a matter of hours and the um, hydrogen peroxide version of that same uh, processing usually at least a week we leave the samples but sometimes a little bit longer sometimes a lot longer and sometimes if the um, hydrogen peroxide processing doesn't work completely like it seems like it's still reacting after a week um, we might add nitric acid to it to sort of like help it along um, because that's the more um, harsh chemical we try to avoid doing that simply so that we don't um, uh, potentially dr destroy anything in the sample that might be a diatom um, that would be worth uh, tracking. But a lot of times when you want to ultimately take the samples to the scanning electron microscope, it's actually more valuable to, um, to use the nitric acid just straight from the beginning. So, um, hey, Sarah, how are you doing? Um, it's nice to see you. I hardly ever get to see you. Uh, during streams. Um, uh, Ribosoid asks, how do you prevent the temperature from running away? Um, we just use glass vials and we don't, um, we don't worry if it runs away too much. Um, it's not going to melt the glass. If we use plastic vials, it could actually melt the plastic and we've seen that happen in our lab sometimes. Um, but if it really starts going, um, what we'll do is we'll take a little beaker, like have like little mini beakers and um, Oh, you tend to just watch VODs, that's fine. You know, no biggie. Uh, the, um, we'll take little mini beakers and put them in, in water. And, <laughs> um, and, uh, and then if the sample gets kind of hot, we'll just uh, drop it in the beaker and let it cool off. Um, it'll be like cold, a beaker with cool water with a vial with the hot stuff in it. Um, and that usually cools it off. And if it doesn't completely cool it off, that's actually okay. Uh, it'll spill out of the out of the little vial into the beaker and still get caught. So um, let's see. I, I know I missed something here for a second. Um, Pacific Plankton said, uh, "Do any of the processes you use cause damage to any diatoms?" They do. Um, if they're lightly silicified diatoms, there's a possibility that the diatom will be completely destroyed. Hi, Pandemic Watch. Um, so um, really lightly. So some of the stuff that we see in your like live samples, um, Pacific, don't uh, wouldn't make it through processing. And so um, uh, that stuff, for example, uh, typically gets destroyed in the in the process of like, what what's going on here Wednesday? You haven't been on stream in a couple of weeks, and you wanted to get in. You want to take a look in the microscope. Is there anything good in there? You're not a fan of monorephid diatoms. Put you down. Um, so, uh, so it could potentially destroy some of the very lightly solidified stuff. So, like you know, the uh, uracilinia, rhizoselenia type diatoms, the girdle bands usually get dissolved in that process. So, um, also, uh, hello, Sarah. Hopefully, you're doing well haven't seen you around much. Um, you know, once classes start, I assume you've just been uh, super busy. And it's a pretty simple process. And then once you have all that reaction complete, um, we just rinse out the samples, basically. So it's like um, I fill up the vial with water, and then uh, shake up the sample, and then basically, uh, uh, basically the uh, 
the vacuum line. After we let it settle for a day, we vacuum off the top part of it. And there's a little bit of uh, sort of that material in the water basically that are down at the bottom of the vial. So then we fill it back up with water and basically you keep cutting out all the chemicals that way and uh, reduce them down to some really small fractions. So after you rinse them, maybe like um, three or four times, it's at the point where all the acids are neutralized or the oxidizers are neutralized. So, um, I think that's everything so far. Science cat. Well, Wednesday wishes she was a science cat, but mostly I think she's just a pain in everybody's butt. She likes to, uh, uh, like four in the morning, she likes to like start knocking stuff off of the end tables and making a racket because she wants to be fed. So, um, this type of time that we have on the, um, on the microscope right here in our field of view is cochinese and cochinese is a monoraphid diatom you can see this one's been broken um, it's actually a pretty large diatom sorry i don't have a scale because i'm using my camera again rather than uh, the one that came with the microscope because i think this one has much better optics i hope you would agree with that um, but uh, and you know we can we can also zoom in very easily with this one to like crazy levels so um, that I can tell you from looking in the, um, eyepiece, um, that, uh, diatom that we're looking at right there is around 75 microns, uh, long. So to give you some sense of that, and its width is something like, uh, 50 microns. So, um, it's actually pretty big for a cochinese. Um, I'm not sure what the species is just off the top of my head, uh, it looks like maybe it's lineata, but I haven't seen even the Rafi valves and looked at them very closely, so I'm not sure. You've been hiding on the upper floor, Sarah. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that. Um, uh, yeah, so my uh, my real camera is uh, at the top of this thing now, and it's um, that's like a nice uh, 4K view if I want uh, that I can run through it. And I can take some really nice 50 megapixel <laughs> uh, images if we wanted to uh, so some of these diatoms. Um, it's a ridiculously high powered uh, camera relative to uh, what we had on there before, which was a five megapixel camera. Um, here's a little tiny cochinese. This is basically the size that we usually see them. Let's see if I can get it in the field of view. Yeah, okay. This is a different species. This is like uh, Neodemonuda. So I think it's cochinese Neodemonuda or close to that, uh, maybe, maybe D Minuta. Um, so, um, again, this is the arafid valve. In other words, we don't see a running down the axis of the, the long axis of the diatom, which is where it would be. Um, but you can see how much smaller it is than the other ones. So for, I've got a, a reticle on the eyepiece that actually allows me to get an estimate of the size. And that one's about 15 microns long. So the other one we looked at was like 75 or 85, something like that uh, micron. So it gives you a, a sense of the sort of size ranges and um, the same genus, but different species. So they're both cochinese, but this one is something different than the other one. So, um, but we could, of course, if I could uh, use the fine controls on the microscope without having it be too jerky, put it in the middle. And then if we really wanted to see um, a zoomed in version of that we could you know, we could get up real close and get in its face um, so you can see the areoli on these are pretty neat um, I'm just magnifying the image we're not actually making it any better so um, you know even zoomed out I think it's got a pretty good picture of what that thing is um, let's see uh, the genetics that code for those patterns that is it's intriguing to you um yeah uh it's pretty pretty interesting genetics and diatoms but i don't actually study the genetic aspects of it i have friends who do that kind of thing um oh there's actually a bunch of really interesting so i guess that is a nitsia it's not a denticula or maybe it's the it's one that's really close to it it looks like it belongs to uh, what's the name of that genus? That's not Nitsia anymore. Um, it used to be Nitsia until like, I don't know, a couple of years ago. 
Um, I'm going to look it up real quick. Pardon, because it's going to bug me. Uh, yes, it's Grunawia, named after Grunau, who's a very famous, um, uh, very famous uh, diatom taxonomist from the early days. And this diatom, I think you would probably agree with me, is either this thing or very close to this thing. Hang on, I will send a link. It's found on the diatoms of diatoms of North America webpage. Here you go. So you can uh, check that against what we're actually looking at, and what you'll see is it has those um, uh, openings at the top that are uh, fibulae, which is the sort of um, big open round bubble-like structures at the top, and then the areoli are relatively coarse. Uh, like it says there in the, um, uh, the example. And you can see the, um, the stri density. And so um, this thing is closely related to Nitsia and also very closely related to Denticula, so the two very similar um, genera. But this thing was split out on its own because of the, um, the way that the fibula are shaped. They have these big open bubbles at the top. And Grunawi is actually a really cool looking, usually pretty easy to distinguish genus because of that structure. So um, let's see. Uh, what's the magnification? So the microscope's magnification is running at 1,000 times. Um, and then you can see in the, I think you can see in the bottom corner, it gives you my um, camera's magnification on top of that. So um, you can, uh, you have to take into consideration that I actually turned on the um, optical zoom on my camera, so everything's double. So that's actually like 3,000 times magnification, but the microscope's actual magnification of it's only like 1,000x. So everything we're looking at is basically, you know, it'll be, it says 1.5, but it's actually three times the size, and the, the, the microscope's putting it at 1,000, so we're like at 3,000 times. Um, but it's, you know, it's just the 1,000 time image made bigger. It's not, um, it's not like optically 3,000 3, times. So um, let's see. Oh, it looks like teeth. Yeah, um, I suppose it does. Uh, they look a little bit like teeth. Denticula, uh, the name denticula means like teeth. Um, and I think that's where people would have stuck this in, uh, or they fought with where it belonged and then ultimately just decided to move it off into its own genus. You can see there's a bunch of those, Grunawia. Here's another one. Um, and there's another Cockanese. Oops, I guess we need to, I guess you can see it. Big Cockanese, another Grunawia. There's some silk grains right on the edge of the, uh, right on the edge of them there. And I, so I think that Cockanese is actually lineata because this big highline ring, it belongs to a Cockanese, and that ring is a um, part of the uh, Raphid valve, the other valve for Cockanese, I think, lineata. Here's a whole bunch of um, the um, Grunawia that we were talking about before. Here's some in girdle view, and um, let's get rid of the zoom for a second. Um, there's some in girdle view and also some in valve view. So that's nice because you can get a nice three-dimensional understanding of the diatom. So valve view, like a map, we're looking at it from the top and, um, and girdle view, which is the one that's in the middle of the screen right now inside the box is actually like looking at it from the side. So, um, you can think of these diatoms kind of like, um, this little slide box, right? So if you looked at it from the top, it has slightly different shape than if you looked at it from the side, right? So the dimensions might not be perfect from each side. And, um, and so, you know, it might be skinnier in one direction and fatter in the other, like this, oops, this is not a perfectly square shape, it's a rectangular prism. And, um, and so, the diatom basically has a similar thing. When we're looking at the one in the middle is like this, and the one we're looking at the top is basically like this. So it looks a little different, 
um, but you can actually see both valves in the girdle view, um, where you can only see one valve at a time in, uh, in the view from uh, the valve view from above. One thing that uh, becomes really neat is that because we're using a light microscope, we can actually see through the diatoms. And if I use optical dissection, which is basically just having like one plane of view in focus at a time, and then slowly um, rotating my, um, my focus knob, what you'll see is that, especially if you look at the, um, the diatom here, I'll move that one into the center, the valve view one. So you can see that the fibulae, which are those little bubble-like things, uh, like teeth-shaped things, are at the top. And um, that is the, actually the bottom valve. We're looking through the entire assembly of the diatom. And then um, we can only see stuff in one plane at a time. But if I focus, and I change the focus as we move through the diatom valve, what you will see, there's the bottom ones. And then there's the top valve. And you can see that you have two different valves. So like our box, we're looking at it from the side, but here we're looking at it from the top. We actually focus on this plane, and then we can focus through the diatom, and now we're focused on the top plane, right? So we're actually seeing, um, uh, what we see is that those little bubbles switch sides. And the bubbles, uh, you know, so they go from that side to this side. Um, that uh, shape is called um, nitsioid symmetry. The raphe is actually associated with the bubbles, so the thing that it uses to crawl around with is associated with the bubble side of the fibula, uh, the fibulae, and um, the raphe switches sides in nitsia from one valve to the other. So there's a raphe on like on the lower valve is on the top, and the raphe on the bottom valve, uh, or the top valve is on the bottom, right? Um, so the raphe switches side, that's called nitsioid symmetry, and it's different from say hansioid symmetry where the raphe would be on the same side. So, um, where are these diatoms from? These are diatoms that were collected from uh, a power plant in Idaho. And um, uh, my friend Anna sent me these. So these are the ones we were looking on, on the SEM on Saturday for the Gomfo Monster. It's the same sample, except for now we're looking at it in the light microscope instead of in the SEM. And we'll probably look at some more tomorrow. I think I'm going to be able to stream tomorrow. Um, afternoon, so on the SEM, and I'm going to look at some uh, samples that actually are processed this time instead of just the ones that are unprocessed. So I hopefully we'll be able to see some internal views. Um, Mark six Mark asks, "Are those dead? Because they're also still yes, um, they're dead now, and they're also mounted in an epoxy. So the epoxy actually allows me to. Oops, we got a new follower. Thank you, ardent candle. Um, the epoxy actually allows me to see." Uh, the diatoms a little more clearly, so it has a special refractive index that actually is geared towards seeing opal and silica, and so it makes the diatom structures stand out even better than they normally do. Um, so a uh, very useful tool for us as um, somebody who studies diatoms, I want to be able to see all of the structure. Um, you know, on the stream I was talking about how I, I knew that um, from some of the diatoms that we were seeing that it must have come from flowing water even though at the time of uh, we were streaming I didn't actually know what it what the sample was collected from um, and it's basically from uh, uh, just adjacent to like uh, a falls where a dam was uh, so it is definitely flowing water um, this is one of the genera that would have indicated to me that they were flowing waters so this is um, a rheophilic rheophilic tech so that just means they like flowing water um, this is rimeria and I think it's Ramiria sinuata. So if you want to look that up, I'm sure that that is on diatoms of North America. Um, it's got an asymmetric valve where um, if we look at the raphe, which is basically the, the line that runs down the middle of the axis of the diatom, you see it's got like a lump on one side and on the other side, it basically looks like a comb, right? So it's like got only on one side it has a bump and there's also some striae missing on the bottom. So I can zoom in so you can see what I'm talking about, right? You see that it has like a raphe that runs through the middle of the valve down the, the axis. And then the two sides are different. They're asymmetric. And they're sort of like a bulge on the right side. And on the left side, it's sort of just like the top of a comb or something, right? Um, so um, that's Rimeria. And you can see that the other valve is the same way, right? So it's got bumps on, on the other side on both valves. 
So you can see me focusing through. There's one side of the valve, valve face. There's the other valve face for it. And Rimeria sinuata is, yeah, there you go, um, is a, uh, a rheophilic indicator. It tells me that there was flowing water either nearby or right where the sample was collected. My chai tea is getting cold. Okay, so that's a cool diatom to see in the sample. Um, there's another diatom that's a, a flowing water indicator. It's this one. So um, this diatom's in girdle view. In other words, we're seeing it from the side. So we can see both valves, and we can also see the girdle bands. So um, the lines that you see at the top and the bottom are striae, but instead of seeing a raphe running through the middle of the valve along the axis, we actually see this open high line band with little dots you know, on the bottom and little dots on the top of it that line it, and that's actually the girdle band. So you have two valves that are held together um, like a box, like a hat box. So I can use my little hat box model to, um, to show you that, right? And there's two valves in our case, uh, each of them basically similar shaped. Um, we're looking at it from the side like this, right? So we're looking at the sides of the valves. We can actually see both of them at the same time. If you were looking at it from valve view, we'd only see the red side or the white side, right? Instead, we're seeing a little red and a little white. We're seeing actually both valves. And in diatoms, the girdle bands actually are sort of spacers that would go between the valves. And um, you could have a bunch of them. So they could expand the height of the valve out. So if it wanted to be like a taller valve so that it could make new valves inside of the old ones and split, it could. Um, because this one is actually kind of neat though, because we're looking at it from the side, we see that it's actually arc shaped, which means the valve face has a, a depression on one side, it's concave on one side, and the other valve is convex. So um, that's actually pretty cool. Um, again, I can tell you immediately what the genus for this is. It's Roycosphenia. And I know that because there's not very many um, diatoms that have an arc shape like that that are also gomphonemoid. In other words, shaped like a fan. And also, um, if we were to look at this thing from uh, the valve view, it also would be sort of shaped like a, a, I don't know, a cone or something like that. as like an ice cream cone almost, or a submarine. Um, so they, um, I, I know what it looks like in both valve and uh, girdle view because I'm familiar with it. Um, but you can see um, that arc shape and that tells you that it belongs to um, the genus Rycosphenia. So uh, Rycosphenia is again a flowing water indicator. So without any um, other knowledge of the sample, I've seen two things that indicate flowing water. This is a uh, Symbella that we saw earlier in the stream. Um, Symbellas are ben benthic diatoms. They don't actually tell me anything about water flowing or anything like that. You can see here's some little tiny acnanthidium, a really tiny little acnanthidium attached to something because, and also you can see those uh, grunaria attached, all attached to some little mass. And that's because the sample wasn't digested. And so I still have some organic matter that's present in them. So, um, let's see. Oh, did, what is, is Frecht Science here? Oh, she is. Hello. Um, hi, Freckled Science. How are you doing? I'm so, it's so weird calling you that instead of uh, Frecht Chemist. I'm just going to call you Amanda, and then maybe you'll, like, uh, like Madonna, you'll just have one name instead of all those other names. Um, you saw I made a post about getting some. Yeah, uh, I need to get some material from this site because um, the diatoms that we're looking for aren't common enough. So like we could look around for a while and not find any of them, um, which is what uh, Rihanna did uh, earlier in the week. And then uh, I made a bunch more slides and uh, looked around quite a bit until I could find some. See, there's some more organic matter. There's some cockanese stuck on it. I have no idea what that giant beastie thing is, but it's it's too big for me to even manage. Um, sorry about that. Um, let's see. I'm also coming off the edge of the slide a bit, so let's. I'm gonna uh, cheat a little bit. So we've been looking at stuff at a hundred, uh, hundred times on objectives. 
and we're super zoomed in and it's actually hard for me to find stuff when the slides are super zoomed in um, if i'm looking for something in particular so if we wanted to go look for our gonfo monster um, i can change the objective to something more reasonable for looking around at um, at a lot of material and see if we could go find some of it. So you can see all that organic matter um, that's present in the slide. Here's an example of our Gonfo monster in girdle view. Again, it has sort of like a fan shape. They live in these sort of fan shaped colonies. So I can zoom up slowly. You can see this is what it looks like at 20x, right? And then this is what it looks like at 40x. That's uh, 400 times magnification because the eyepiece is another 10x magnifier. And um, we can start to see the important structures of the diatom at that size. Again, it's in girdle view, but here we're actually looking at two full cells. Uh, let's see, what did I miss? Uh, uh, there that like n equal 1.33 I don't know um, let's see so the organism needs to oxygenate water oh oxygenated water oh they actually probably I don't know if it's oxygen uh, pandemic that they there's a reason why they need flowing water um, oxygen might be it um, it it could just be they've like uh, they grow attached by these stalks at the bottom and um, And so it could just be they have an advantage where other diatoms can't colonize flowing water very well. Um, but the uh, but the diatoms that are here, these uh, these giant gomphonemas and uh, gomphonies and the little roicosphenias and um, and some of those other things, they actually probably can colonize that environment. So it could just be they found an opportunity and and do better there. So um, it says 1.5, but it's much larger than that. Yeah, so it's 1.5 multiplied by 2 because I have my uh, digital zoom on my camera on, and then uh, the, uh, the light microscope is actually, um, right now it's at 400 times, so you're seeing um, everything is 800 times right now. Uh, but um, yeah, there's some complicated math involved with figuring out what it actually is, so. What's that noise? Oh, a cheer. Thank you for the cheer. Uh, oh, it's two chooks. Hello, two chooks. Um, let's see. Hello, I'm lurking, not lurking. I like all the other names. Was it like a nuclear waste place? No, it's a hydro plant. I think Toronto has some nuclear waste places nearby. Um, there's a really cool story about that, uh, uh, Amanda, if you're still lurking. Um, the um, There are some diatoms that they find growing in the um, cooling ponds associated with um, nuclear power plants. And some of them have these really sort of truly mutant structures. So um, I can't remember off the top of my head the name of that diatom, uh, but it got its own genus because it had these structures that nothing else, uh, there's nothing else like it. Um, and it was found uh, growing and living in uh, nuclear power plants cooling towers or cooling I think it's cooling ponds like outside of the towers um, but uh, pretty cool uh, uh, story with those um, the structures are only meaningful if you have an SEM and uh, and you happen to be a nerdy uh, diatomist um, but uh, they're just little pores that go through the diatom that are shaped in a really weird way um, they look like several structures that are kind of fused together and, uh, and a little confusing as a result. Okay, let's, um, I got another one of these giant uh, gomphonema. This one's on its own instead of being in a little colony. So I stopped to put a little bit of oil because I'm jumping up to uh, 1000 times magnification, which for us will be uh, much higher than that because I have my uh, zoom in um, and then I have a filter that I need to match um, the objectives with in order to get the differential interference contrast that's the type of optics that we have here so um, uh, this diatom is actually quite large um, 
startled me with that. <laughs> um, the uh, for gomphonema, usually they don't grow this big. Um, this one is. Hang on a second, because I can only measure it with my eyepiece and by turning my little uh, scale bar in the eyepiece or reticle around. Um, this one is. Uh, almost perfectly 100 microns long. So um, gomphonema typically don't grow that big. Um, you know, the true gomphonema are pretty, un it's pretty uncommon for them to grow that large. Um, again, this is in girdle view. So the two valves are visible, um, both valves are visible, and you can also see a characteristic shape for gomphonema, which is basically one side is a little bit like the um, uh, the distance between the valve faces is a little bit larger at uh, at the bottom of my picture than it is at the top. Um, you'll also note that um, at the see if we rotate all the way through the image, um, the front end of the gomphonema has sort of like I don't know what do they call those uh, the front a prow like the front end of a boat. It sort of comes down, and, um, and you know on a boat it's up but it's on the bottom one, it's coming up. Um, so it has sort of like a prow-like structure on the shape of the valve, like it, it kind of curls outward and upward um, on uh, the one end. And on the other end, if we focus through it, you can actually see these little, um, like at the top of the picture, um, you can see that it has, it's this way, um, uh, the, uh, uh, these little sort of bubble-like structures and uh, they look like maybe little eyes or something. But in fact, those are apical pore fields. So they are tiny little pore fields that are at the base of the diatom. And um, gomphonema have what we call a head pole, or sort of a, a top side, and a foot pole, which is the bottom side. And I can tell the head pole from the foot pole because the head pole on gomphonema always has this prow shape and the foot pole always has those little fields of little tiny pores. You can't actually see the pores in a light microscope, but we see them all the time in the scanning electron microscope. So if you tune in tomorrow, we can look at some of those. Um, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm sort of m missing the chats. Um, uh, is there a super fun site or two near campus? Um, near our campus, yes, there are two of them. Um, that's a, a crazy question to ask me, um, Sarah, because I, I'm teaching an environmental geology class this semester, and I made a big deal about the fact that um, there's two super fun sites in Terre Haute. One of them is right next to campus, like you could walk to it from campus. Um, so we go to school at Indiana State University, which is in Terre Haute, and uh, so there's like a um, chemical spill that got into the groundwater, and they actually don't know who's responsible for it, um, but it, it's been cleaned up. So it's, you know, like an ex super fun site. And then there's another one where some other chemicals got in the groundwater on the other side of town. So, uh, let's see. Uh, essentially living quartz crystals, except for it's not actually quartz, it's opal, because it's hydrated uh, SiO2, um, which means that um, the, uh, the silica structure is not crystalline. So um, it's, it's a um, mineraloid, not a mineral. Um, like quartz is, right? So uh, you know that X stands for times right. Yeah, I know what X stands for. You're asking me? I know, I know all about the X. Me and the X go way back. Um, let's see. Do they, make, uh, do they make light field microscopes? We're looking at a light field microscope right now. Um, dark field is just a, a way of like putting something in front of the, um, or whatever, getting oblique lighting, um, from usually putting something between the, uh, the light source and the objective. Um, bright field is what we call it, not light field, but bright field is basically, uh, there's nothing between your, uh, camera lens. It's just like an open hole. It goes to the light source at the bottom of your microscope comes up through nothing, hits your condenser, condenses it, hits the slide, goes through the sample, goes into the objective, and then basically the eyepiece, or in my case, the camera and the eyepiece. Um, so that's what's called bright field, the idea that there's basically nothing between them. Hello, Anarchy. Um, can somebody shout out Anarchy? Pacific Plankton's still here. Um, so uh, 
the uh, that's what what's called bright field. Um, dark field is similar, uh, except for there's something in there that causes the light to bend around it, and then um, you're getting oblique lighting. You can also get dark field from shining light sideways or from above. So sometimes people do that. Um, Apparently Stanford has one they made. Well, lots of people have it. So, um, uh, let's see. What's happening? Um, you love the twisted center. Oh, I, maybe you're, oh, right here at the base, at the head pull where it looks like they're um, twisted. Um, let's go back to actually the right. So I think what Sarah is talking about is at the bottom down there, there's sort of like a twist. It's actually not a twist. It's uh, a bit of the girdle band from the top valve and a bit of the girdle band from the bottom valve, and they overlap with each other. So they're just like um, they're just like uh, dovetailed together, and also at the top, uh, at the bottom of the foot pole as well. They're sort of they sort of fit over top. One fits inside the other. So has whopper. Oh yeah. Um, let's see. Am I going to be here for a bit? Do I want a big raid? I mean, you can bring people in if you want, Tropical Geek. I, I, you know, I'm always happy to entertain more people. If uh, you're bringing paleontologizing's group over or something, um, you know, that's fine. Um, you know, whatever. I can take whatever you throw at me. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I'm probably going to stream, um, you know, for maybe another 45 minutes or something. I don't know. And then we can go maybe raid Dell or something like that. Um, let's see, uh, oh, talking about Anarchy Kitchen, you made some delicious food for, uh, for your stream. I don't doubt it. Be, bibimbap. Bibimbap? I don't actually know what that is. Um, yeah, the two girdle bands are crossed, yeah. In the, and you can see that they are in the middle of the diatom, they are not. So this is actually a really interesting for me diatom, and um, because it's it's got some weird structures. Um, if we zoom in, one of the things that we can see when we look at the um, the stri, which are those little finger-like things coming over the sides, uh, in this case, is that they're actually composed of two little rows. I don't know if you can see them very clearly. Like um, for some of them, you can kind of see there's like two little stippled patterns that kind of alternate back and forth. We refer to this as, um, <laughs> as by <-seriate. laughs> Amanda, did you just start to raid me before the raid actually got here? Is that what's going on? Um, so those are, um, <laughs> I'm gonna wait. I'm waiting. <laughs> You've spoiled it, though. That's the, you're like you sh sh yelled surprise before the surprise got here. <laughs> um, so there's two little rows of striae, and in diatoms we refer to that as biseriate. Also in other things, when there's two rows of uh, of holes uh, that are side by side that alternate, we refer to that as biseriate. And um, so the biseriate rows in this are actually pretty interesting because. Gomphonema, which is where this thing probably belongs, don't normally have um, biseriate uh, striae. They, they just have basically either little simple holes or sometimes little C-shaped areoli. All right, so the raid actually did, did show up. Uh, the, uh, uh, welcome in, raiders. It's uh, paleontologizing with his uh, raiding party of 99 people. He always has such a great, great big, great big raid, um, which is nice to see. Um, welcome to my quiet evening stream. Um, we're looking at uh, some super zoomed in versions of some uh, diatoms from um, a uh, hydro plant in, in Idaho, was collected from Idaho and then sent to me by my friend Anna, um, who studies diatoms and, uh, and works in Idaho. And I think they would just sent them into her um, for water quality. Um, analysis and uh and so actually what we're looking at is this thing ignore the big green box that's my camera uh i can't make it go away right now or maybe i can i don't know let me see if i do this does it go away no it's being stubborn about the box um it's not actually on my uh on my camera either it's just on the stream so um 
But this is a giant diatom that we were looking for. This exact diatom is the one that we were looking for in my SCM stream on Saturday. And, uh, and I was referring to it as the Gonfo monster. And I still think it's a Gonfo monster. I still think it's a monstrous diatom. It's enormous for this, you know, for a diatom. Um, let's see, they're going to roll off of my screen before I can do anything about it. If I don't, uh, if I do oops, everyone. now I'm getting attacked by the good news, everyone. Um, thank you for all the follows. Sorry about that. Uh, it's uh, a challenge for me to keep up with everything while I'm also trying to uh, control a microscope, but I'm happy to have everybody join me here. I'm looking at uh, diatoms, which are a type of uh, algae that live in water. I'm going to have to mute that or I'm going to get good news, everyone, all the time. Um, thank you for the raid, uh, paleontologizing. I hope your stream went well. I saw you were, um, you were talking about uh, uh, some dinosaur. Uh, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, Spinosaurus, S something like that, um, uh, that's been in the news quite a bit recently. So um, uh, uh, hopefully that was, uh, that was a fun, uh, fun stream, and uh, it's nice to have everybody here. Let's see. Um, so uh, let's, while we're roaming through these things, um, uh, let's see. How are the diatoms tonight? Uh, the diatoms are, they're good. This is, uh, this was like Bigfoot I was looking for in my SEM. And uh, I thought maybe I hadn't found it, but in fact, I had found it. Um, so this is our, uh, you know, our cryptid uh, diatom that shouldn't be, uh, but that we actually found. So I was looking through the sample. It's pretty rare in the sample. Um, Iopta says, what do diatoms attack? They don't attack anything. Um, that's actually a bit of the joke. Uh, they're little tiny microorganisms that are beneficial to practically in practically every case. And, uh, and I made them sound like they were giant monsters from a horror movie because I think it's funny. Uh, that's just my sense of humor, I guess. Um, so uh, they're, they're beneficial. They, they create oxygen and, uh, and we need oxygen. So people tend to think that trees make all the oxygen, but in fact, diatoms make as much or more. And so um, they're, uh, they're actually very important components of the ecosystem as well. They're basically a food source for everything in aquatic ecosystem. So water bears eat them, snails eat them, fish eat them, everything eats them. They are basically the, the base of the food web in practically every aquatic ecosystem, including the ocean, uh, rivers, lakes, you name it. A uh, critical part of our ecosystem, um, aquatic ecosystems. Um, I know there's some people saying a bunch of things and I'm barely keeping up with it. Is my camera a Nikon? No, this is an Olympus OMD EM1 uh, Mark II, which is a micro four thirds camera, um, Amanda. And it's, uh, it's a little gem. I absolutely love this camera. I use it for macro photography. I use it for telephoto stuff for birds. Um, I use it, I can take pictures of snowflakes and uh, with incredible detail. And uh, I can also shoot a hawk uh, with, uh, with my camera from like a million miles away. And, uh, and also it mounts directly under my microscope now because I got a little uh, C mount for it. And um, uh, it's, there's no autofocus, uh, uh, right? That's my hand moving uh, on, the, on the other side that you're not seeing. I'm controlling the knob. Um, so it's, it's, uh, I'm just playing with it because it's a habit. Um, like Gomphotherium, uh, is that a type of dinosaur? Or is that a name that you made up? Um, Gompho is probably a pretty common prefix. Um, but you, maybe you know what the, uh, hey, I got the name right, Spinosaurus. Um, maybe you know what the Latin for Gompho is. I don't, I don't actually know what it means. Uh, I would guess it means like fan-shaped or something, but who knows. Um, also, uh, Constabebbles here. So uh, paleontologizing, if, I'm sure everybody knows who he is. Um, he does uh, streams where he talks about uh, paleontology. And I do sometimes streams where I talk about paleontology, but, um, but I look at the little things and he looks at the really big things. So, um, and my things have no bones and his things are all bone. Um, so like opposite ends of the spectrum in practically every way. And also um, diatoms uh, evolved roughly the same time as most of the dinosaurs. So um, there's a lot of parallels between the dinosaurs and the diatoms. Um, Oh, uh, Constabebbles here as well. So you should, uh, you should probably give Constabebble a follow. I see that uh, Pacific Plankton gave her a shout out. Um, she's a, a really fun uh, stream to follow as well. Um, 
Oh, you're finally getting your own Spinosaur paper published. Oh, nice. That's good. Um, congratulations on that. Uh, that's really cool. Um, yeah, Pseudonitsia, so Pacific Plankton's pointing out there, there is one diatom that's kind of, it doesn't really attack people so much as defend itself, though. You know, like, the idea that it's attacking is sort of like, well, it just sort of makes a nasty toxin and then gets eaten. So is that really attacking, or is that like, you know, it doesn't want to be attacked? Um, trees suck, so let's cut them all down. I think that's a, um, that's a hot take, uh, Amanda. I don't know um, that you'd get a lot of support from it, but as long as you replant trees, I suppose you can cut them down. That's, that's basically what we do. Um, do they attack water models, molecules? No. Nope. Um, let's see. I don't know that they do anything to water molecules in particular. Uh, they, they just uh, live in water. Uh, maybe they use it for uh, components of it. Uh, for their skeleton. Um, let's see. I'm way behind in the chat, I'm sure of that. Um, are plastics a threat to diatoms? Probably not. Uh, m most plastics are probably not going to uh, affect a diatom. They're, they're small and they don't eat things. Um, so they might use plastics to grow on. Um, uh, there's some really ultra micro. Um, small, ultra small microplastics in the environment that um, might be small enough to actually cause a problem for diatoms, but my guess is they probably don't. Um, they've got these really tiny little holes that kind of screen everything out. So, oh, to remove the green box. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember what it is. I, there's probably a way to do it. It's just, uh, you know, you got the green box. Um, it's not actually the autofocus box. It's the, the zoom box. It's going to show me exactly what will we zoom into if I zoom in, right? So that's, we get crazy and zoom way in with my camera using the, uh, the power of digital technology. And then you can see that the striae are biseriate. Um, it's just the zoom box. So I'm sorry, it's annoying. If I just put it on the 1.5x, it wouldn't be nearly as annoying. Okay. So uh, I've been sitting on this project for the better part of a decade. Oh, I have, um, you know what, um, paleontologizing, I published, last year I published a paper that I'd been sitting on for about nine years, and the year before it I published a paper I'd been sitting on for about eight years, and um, so I've got like a string of these old papers, and I still have like maybe five more of them. Um, I mean, I published a lot of papers last year, but, uh, but it was just like one of many, right? Um, so I know that feeling, just have like something sitting around forever, and then it's good to just get it out there. Welded. Okay, cool. Um, how micro are diatoms? Diatoms are usually in the size range from about two microns up to uh, the biggest ones are maybe, I mean, the like, really biggest ones are like maybe a millimeter, but um, uh, most of them are kind of in the two microns to, in the terrestrial systems are like two microns to about 100 microns. So they're in what we would refer to as a, a geologist as the silt size fraction. Some of them might be a little bit smaller, uh, you know, into the clay fraction, and some of them might get up into the, uh, the sand fraction, fine sand, um, just for, for clarity. Okay, thanks for the cheeky plug. It's the best plug I have for you. Um, you should check her out. It's got, it's got a good stream, it's fun. Um, time out, diatoms evolved at the same time as dinosaurs. They did, yeah, uh, like uh, after the Triassic, basically. That's, that's where diatoms, most of the diatoms evolved as far as what we know. Um, diatoms are not earlier than that, no. Um, <laughs> pale, oh, paleontologizing, uh, he raided you once and it made your life? Well, good. Uh, you know, he's got a giant clout. He carries around a giant crowd of people who love him. So, uh, yeah, I know. I know what you're talking about, uh, uh, Amanda. I, I know what you meant. Um, I'm on it. Let's see, um, are diatoms animals? No, they're algae, uh, but um, they're kind of a weird algae because they can crawl around. And so you might confuse them for something, you know, like um, people usually think of, um, of algae as things that just kind of sit there, right? That don't move or do anything uh, except for grow. But in fact, diatoms can crawl around and um, there's another one of these, uh, uh, that one is the Gumphanese. That's the other monster, but just a fragment of it. 
Um, but diatoms can actually crawl around and reposition themselves. And so if I had a live sample, which I don't have any in my house at the moment, um, uh, you would be able to see them crawling, especially because once they get on the light microscope, the light from the, um, from the objective heats up the water a little bit and also uh, provides them with some light so they can start, uh, they start to activate. Oh, we got a subscription. Thank you. Oh, holy crap. A anonymous gift giving all kinds of subs out to every kind of people. That was amazing. Um, hey, look, it's dangling. Hello, breaded shrimp 23. Um, that was a huge anonymous gift. Uh, I want to thank whoever that was. That was amazing. Um, hopefully you guys get to use some of uh, these cool, uh, really cool, um, uh, emotes that I made. Here's, here's a whole set of them, rainbow colored diatoms that I, I have. Uh, feel free to pop those in the channel all you like. Uh, anonymous gifter, what an amazing gift. Um, yeah, so feel free to, to whatever the uh, emotes that you got access to, you can spam them all you like. That's fine. It's cool. Uh, and take them with you when you go. You got a month of them. Um, I should point out that it, um, all of the, uh, if any subscriptions that come in here um, that result in me getting some money, I put all of that money towards um, student research in my lab or buying supplies that are used for the stream. I don't take home any money um, from my, um, from my uh, streaming at all. So I'm, I'm not here to make money, I'm here to teach people things. So, um, but it's a really great gift for you and uh, anonymous gifter um, for giving those out. Um, let's see. So, uh, is that semicircular thing? Oh, sorry. I can't keep up with it. Um, there are some things on here that aren't diatoms because the sample was, uh, digested, but, um, like this thing, this one's a circle. That's a diatom. This one's actually a diatom called cockanies. And I mentioned before when, uh, before the big rating party came in, cockanies are, uh, what are called monoraphid diatoms. So a raphe is uh, this sort of uh, two-part piece that look like a butterfly antenna sort of sideways that runs down um, the axis of the long axis of the diatom here in this case. And um, it's what the diatom uses to crawl around with or to attach to a surface with. And so um, this one only has it on one valve. It has a valve that's like this that has these little um, little areoli that are, are formed in sort of like uh, um, curved rows. And then um, this one has a, like a hyaline band and then uh, another set of areoli outside of that. But if we use the microscope, we can actually focus through the diatom and then we can see what's on the other side, which is kind of nice. We're like looking at, um, I'm sure you've seen like, um, um, you know, uh, uh, MRI or something where, where they can see through things. Um, but we can actually see through diatoms because uh, microscopes are also, light microscopes are like this, are transmitted light. And so um, if we set the focal height at a different place, we can actually see what's on the other side of the diatom. And in this case, we can see that uh, here's the valve on the other side. It actually looks very different on the back side. It's like, um, you know, like there's two totally different sizes and shapes to the um, structures on the valve. So it has this sort of appearance um, on one valve. This is what we would call the pseudo raphe valve or the araphid valve. Uh, it doesn't have a raphe, but it has a sternum, which is where the raphe would normally go that runs down the axis. But there's not those little butterfly antenna shaped things where are actually little um, holes or slots that are in the, um, the, the cell wall of the diatom. And um, it doesn't have them on this side, it filled them in. So it used to have a hole and then it basically it filled it in with silica because it wasn't using it and it didn't want to have uh, the backside basically exposed to things. And so if we focus all the way through, we can see that on one side, it looks like this. It's like we got a quarter and we can see the head sides and the tail side, right? If we, if we focus through it. So um, because we're looking through them and they're made out of glass basically or opal and silica, we can see what's on the other side. So this one has this shape on one side and this shape on the other side, right? So totally different um, valves. And the valves can fall apart. So you might find just the araphid valve or just the raphid valve and not know that they go together because there might be other things that are egg-shaped in your sample, for example. 
Um, how do I measure how old they are? Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, usually we date sediments. We don't date diatoms. So we don't know the age of an individual, if that's what you're asking. Like, I can't tell you this one is um, six months old or something like that. But, um, but the sediments that are around them have things like tephra that can be dated or radiocarbon that can be dated. Um, that can give us uh, an estimate of the age that's pretty accurate. So in the same way that we would date a dinosaur, we, we basically don't, I mean, dinosaurs, you can't date the bones because the carbon is all dead by that point. And most of the bone material has probably been replaced in, for most of them. Um, but you can date the rocks around them based on the geology and the stratigraphy of that area. Diatoms can be done the same way. Um, you, you, it's a fossil, so you're dating you know, what, it's, what it's in, not it, for the most part. Um, is that a broken diatom on the side? Yeah, I don't know. I uh, can't keep up with like old comments. So, uh, you know, it's hard for me to, to keep up with everything. Um, oh, you didn't get one? Uh, that's too bad. Uh, maybe anonymous gifter will give you some more. Um, do diatoms have chloroplast? I opt to ask. They do. Um, they're algae. And um, so in their living um, state, they would have chloroplast present in them. Um, colors the colors are fake it's true sorry don't don't uh i they're colored by me in photoshop uh, or lightroom or whatever um and del maxim is here hello that del somebody give del a shout they did okay good um is my lab in idaho no my lab is currently in my living room we're, we're in my living room or dining room and living room um but uh this is not my actual science lab this is my home science lab and uh, sometimes I work on science at home. Uh, but I live in Indiana, and my university is Indiana State University. Indiana State University, where the sycamores. Um, so uh, I sometimes stream from my scanning electron microscope lab, which I will do tomorrow in the afternoon around uh, 1 o'clock Eastern time. So if you want to see what these same things look like in a scanning electron microscope, super up close and not this kind of up close where I'm just like wiggling a wheel on my camera but like you know like actually see detail up close uh check it out check it out come in tomorrow take a look um looks like there's no Mallory in the stream yeah well Mallory's not allowed in my house so because COVID rules and also it's past midnight here so um she works in my lab um let's see uh Del Maximum yes yes uh, freckled science is yes freckled chemist she's rebranded herself um, because twitch would not give her freckled chemist because some jerk took it um, let's see uh, let's see um, we have so many science streamers here at the same time yeah well I'm just gonna let you know that like Pacific Plankton's usually here because she's my primary moderator and uh, Dell usually shows up because he's also one of my moderators. And they're my buddies. They're part of my microscope streaming squad. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe OpenSet will show up. He often does, uh, too. So the microscope streamers hang together in a pretty tight click. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, you don't want to be a bio... Oh, she doesn't want to be a biologist. I don't think she ever did. She wanted to be a chemist. Um, yeah, 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 wind, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to keep up with the, uh, the whole chat, um, what's the average lifespan of a diatom? Um, most diatoms live about a month, maybe, uh, some of them might live a whole year. I gave you a range in sizes for diatoms, um, we've seen one in here that was 100 microns earlier, and then here's this little tiny piece of crap diatom down here uh, let's see it's it's actually this little thing right here that looks like a little pointy tail coming off of uh, this other diatom so the one that's on the side here is a fragment of Grunauia and then there's this little tiny like thing sticking 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 up that way um, off of one end of the diatom and that's actually a little teeny tiny diatom and the little teeny tiny diatom that's on there is uh, maybe 10 microns long. So we saw one that was 100 microns uh, earlier pretty easily uh, broke 100 microns. This one is 10 or, or less. 
and I can't actually tell what the genus is because it's on its it's on an edge. So, um, you know, everybody's having storms everywhere, and uh, and here in Indiana, we got nothing. Got a little bit of ice the other day when the rain froze, and that's basically it. Uh, we haven't seen anything, and I'm not complaining. So uh, it's fine. It doesn't have to be terrible here. Um, let's see. Uh, it, it, the mustaches are real. Don't uh, don't listen to Amanda. The diatoms with the mustaches, those ones, they are fancy. AF. You know what I'm talking? They've got a mustache. Uh, that's real. Let's see. Uh, diatoms have some very interesting processes for reproduction, or don't they? Diatoms reproduce in a very interesting way. Um, most of the time they reproduce by... Uh, um, so I was using this as a little prop earlier. So if we, if we think of uh, centric diatoms, which basically look like little circles, right? So I've got two valves, one is red and one is white. Um, what they will do is uh, they will sort of start to expand the diatom outward by adding more girdle bands. And uh, those are sort of wrap around the outside edge and they get bigger and bigger this way. And then what it does is it grows a new diatom valve inside the old ones like that. And then these two will split apart and make one diatom, and these two will split apart and make another one. So essentially, each diatom gets one valve of the parent and one valve of the daughter. And they do that um, just through binary fission. So typical cloning organism, uh, like an amoeba, it splits apart, and then you end up having two diatoms where you used to have one diatom and they can replicate very quickly in that process. But one of the things that happens is um, on this valve, it stays basically the same size, right? So, um, but the one that grows inside of the smaller part basically becomes even smaller. So one of the valves is much smaller. One of the valves is the same size as the parent. And then when this one replicates, one of the children, one of the daughters is also even smaller. So uh, what you end up with is a population of diatoms that over time, progressively, the diameter shrinks. And so you end up getting smaller and smaller as you get older. And um, as you make more and more clones, the population gets smaller and smaller. So that's actually really interesting because at some point, you don't have enough room to put all the junk that goes inside your cell inside your skeleton. And when that happens and the conditions are good, diatoms will switch from being asexual reproducers to sexual reproducers. So uh, these things will basically split open in the water column and some will become boys and some will become girls and then it's a party and uh, the good kind of party uh, where there's treats. So um, the, uh, the diatoms will then reproduce and the diatom offspring that's made through sexual reproduction has the really big size again. So it grows like an egg and gets bigger and bigger. And then uh, that big one then starts to split again and goes small, 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 small. So over time, divisions getting smaller. So they switch back to asexual reproduction. And then in the process, will get so small that they need to switch to sexual reproduction again. So it's like a broken wheel, right? So it goes around through these sort of cycles and then basically occasionally it has to jump to asexual, from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction. It's pretty interesting. Um, it leads to a bunch of different issues, which is that diatoms can um, get smaller with age, which is like the opposite of everything else. Although they don't grow smaller, they don't grow, um, except for when they're sort of in that egg stage, they grow there. Um, they just split, and the, the one stays the same size, and one shrinks every time a little bit. So you end up with uh, diatoms that uh, create like a size series from the uh, giant baby to the shriveled old man, and the shriveled old man eventually wants to have sex and, and goes back to the baby. So um, to give you some idea, um, that's basically how their reproduction cycle works. It's a little weird, right? Um, it's kind of the reverse of what everything else does. Um, let's see. It's just the typical dining room, microscope, living room, diatom sample, streaming, science room. Yeah, that's, uh, this is my home lab. Uh, I've got, uh, I've got another microscope, as most people do, uh, for my daughter. So there's my real microscope, and then I've got a mini microscope so my daughter can also look at stuff on the microscope with me. Um, these are kind of neat. 
um, just little, uh, it doesn't have eyepieces, it just has a camera head. And then you can just look at the camera instead of looking into eyepieces. For people who don't like to like, you know, use eyepieces because they get a headache from it or whatever. And then uh, I've got just, uh, I've got slide boxes everywhere. I've got two shelves full of slide boxes basically right next to me. And, uh, and I've got uh, some sticks over there with uh, water bears on them. Uh, well, I presume they do. I haven't looked at all of them yet. Um, and sometimes we do a little bit of looking at water bears, for example, or other living pond organisms. In the back of my house, I have a little koi pond, which has, uh, you know, where I, it's where I keep my own personal diatom farm, um, growing in amongst uh, as food for my goldfish that are back there, um, because I think the raccoons ate all of my koi, but um, I try to replace them occasionally. Just koi are expensive, especially if the raccoons are going to keep eating them. Earlier on the stream, we saw this diatom, which is um, Rycosphenia. Uh, I think it's Rycosphenia curvata. Pretty sure that's the, the species name. Um, and Rycosphenia had sort of like a cup shape, like it was like, you know, shaped like an uh, arc. And the raphid side, which is the side that we're looking at right now, um, is the internal part of that arc because it likes to grow attached to other things. And then it also has a foot pole and a head pole, just like the Gomphonema that we were looking at. Um, it has a big side and a small side, and uh, the bottom part has an apical pore field, the same as the giant one that we were looking at. Um, but we only saw this one girdle view before, and this was what it actually looks like in the rafi view. Um, and if I could focus through it and the other valve were completely visible, which this one, it's like slightly dissolved, um, we'd be able to see that it has tiny little short rafies at the top and bottom. So it's kind of a, we a little weird guy. Um, uh, yeah, I keep it a Mallory Friesen. Well, she's come over for dinner before, parties and stuff. Um, but like, you know, she's not going to be here at my house, like hanging out with me and my family. So, um, you think you used to know someone who taught at Terre Haute? Oh, that's cool. Uh, let's see. Mud love. Mud love? Mud love. I didn't know if it said mud love or mod love. I also love mud, you know? I like getting dirty. Um, <laughs> this here is a junk diatom. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah okay uh thank you kind gift subber yeah definitely so many gift subs they came out that was like a giant explosion of them um and oh what's going on right now oh i'm getting a host by garden outside oh thank you garden outside um that's nice of you uh are you in a garden outside or are you going to garden outside? Like, is it a noun or a verb? Um, can I 3D print a diatom? I've done that. Uh, I don't have any with me, but um, uh, I have 3D printed diatoms at school. So I can show you tomorrow if you come to the stream tomorrow. Um, but uh, you can definitely do that. Um, uh, are they genetically the same? Yes, they're clones, uh, except for when they reproduce sexually, they exchange genetic material, and so those ones aren't clones anymore. Uh, those ones are like any other population. They have sex, and they, they don't clone anymore. So um, a lot of little things swap their reproduction methods around. Yeah, Del, the uh, rotifers and uh, cladocera, so like Daphne and things, they all have weird reproductive cycles. Uh, and Hydra are the same way. Clone, clone, clone sex. It's a cool structure for a lot of organisms. So I'm so far behind. I, every scroll, and there's more comments and questions. Um, Constable, can you see changes in water properties uh, in the different clones, like tree rings or ice cores? Um, I can see changes in the diatom assemblage associated with changes in environmental conditions. That's how I actually use them to reconstruct past climate or water level or drought or nutrient changes. So like if I were taking a core next to a place where people lived, I could see when the people inhabited that site. Um, so for example, they would have a change in the water um, quality associated with farming in the landscape, adding nutrients to a pond or something. So I can actually use that to reconstruct like when people moved into an area, when they moved out of an area, if it's like a really old record of people coming and going, uh, I could use it to reconstruct when major droughts were, I could use it to reconstruct changes in salinity. So I have some uh, examples from previous streams where we looked at um, uh, like marine 
um, incursions into freshwater systems because the saline diatoms and the freshwater diatoms are very different from each other. So um, you can use them for reconstructing all kinds of things, but you can't look at like one clone and another clone at the like individual level and be able to tell something about what's going on, except um, people can use isotopic information from the skeletons of diatoms, just not like uh, not like a tree ring or an ice core where there's a band or anything. They'll just dissolve the whole thing and then look at the chemistry of it, um, typically like the isotopes that the oxygen or the silica have in them. Um, so they can use it to track moisture um, using Rayleigh distillation processes. So like um, isotopes change as the, as the moisture moves farther inland, for example. I can talk about that some other time. Um, it's a little complicated to try to answer a question about. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, this kind of advantage or disadvantage of creating your own body out of glass. Yeah, so diatoms have an advantage, which is that um, there's silica everywhere in terrestrial systems, so they can actually, um, they don't have any trouble getting access to silica, which is, uh, you know, so like, it's a good resource. It keeps things from being able to eat them or digest them sometimes and um, gives them a lot of uh, structure to resist things like bacteria or um, uh, invasions from, oh, here's some Rycosphenia on its side along with a denticula. That's a Rycosphenia right there. Oh, it's not denticula, it's Grunawia. Um, on the other side here, that's a Grunawia in girdle view. That is a Rycosphenia in, oops, I lost it, I lost it. It's a Rycosphenia in girdle view, so you can see both valves. Um, so uh, there's a huge advantage to it um, in that they, they create a, a cell wall that's rigid, and, um, but then there's like, you know, things they have to do in order to have that cell wall. So the reproductive cycle is actually kind of limited by the fact that they can't grow. They can only shrink, right, when they reproduce. Um, it doesn't, I have, you know, at least two microscopes. Here in the house, I actually have another microscope in my office as well. So, um, you know, my wife is a diatomist and I'm a diatomist and, you know, short stuff also is kind of a diatomist. So she can actually identify diet, some diatoms, um, at age seven. It was her birthday today, I should point out. So happy birthday to my daughter. Um, she's got the stack of toys on the table behind me that you can't see. And, uh, I don't think you can see them anyway. Um, but it's her birthday. So she's asleep already. Um, she woke up at like four in the morning and was on her iPad. Like she was so excited. She couldn't sleep. I think about her birthday. So you grew up in a single microscope family. That is sad anarchy. That is really sad. I don't know. Um, you know, I didn't have any microscopes when I was a kid. Uh, I grew up poor. So, uh, now that I have them, I just feel opulence, you know, luxury. Um, you know, but, uh, my daughter, she's got one. Well, we could borrow one, actually. It's not mine. Um, let's see. Oh, garden outside was raiding with a party of one. That's a big raid. Um, I don't know if I can handle a party of one. <laughs> um, that's crazy. Can you reliably date various clones? Uh, no. Uh, you can't date diatoms at all. You date the sediments that they're in. Um, so uh, you can't really, like, take enough carbon out of the diatom to date a carbon um so uh but we can date the sediments pretty reliably using radiocarbon and that sort of thing right you have a garden and a greenhouse outside oh well, that's cool uh, i'm not trying to make fun of your raid uh I'm actually it's great that you came in um and are hosting us so um right uh you're gonna come visit before you teach oh i'm gonna I don't teach tomorrow and actually I have a little bit of a break in my schedule. I've been like completely overwhelmed last week and uh, I only lost track of like 12 emails that were super important uh, this week. So I'm doing a little bit better this week and uh, I'm almost to the point. I'm down to like one, no, two critical emails I haven't answered that I feel terrible about because there's deadlines and uh, I can barely keep up with them. But um, like Thursday when I normally would have classes all day long, my late class, uh, I have like a guest speaker, so I don't have to prepare anything for. And my like afternoon class, like middle afternoon class, 
um, my PhD student is teaching and the, uh, the early afternoon, no, early late morning class that I would normally teach, they have a quiz, so I don't have to prepare anything for that. Um, so that's why I think I'll be able to stream on Wednesday, but like I'm in like a crazy semester for, for teaching, so I can barely keep up with it. Um, you know, if I missed a question and you asked a question, um, and, um, and I'm, so I'm super far behind and I, I can't do anything like while I'm perpetually stuck behind. So uh, you could check out my Discord if, if you want to ask me questions about diatoms or um, you can step in tomorrow um, while we're streaming from the scanning electron microscope and I'll, I probably will have one of my students around to help me. Oh my goodness, a cheer for my daughter. A happy birthday cheer. Thank you, Rams Reef. Um, uh, a saltwater tank. Yeah, um, I can't, I have uh, fish outside, so... Uh, that's about as much maintenance as I can manage. I barely have to feed them because there's diatoms in the pond and they just replicate themselves. And of course it's winter time here, so they're all under a layer of ice right now and they're barely moving. Um, so I can manage them quite well uh, because I don't have to do anything. But uh, um, generally it's, I, I think saltwater tanks are too complicated for me to keep up with. Um, somewhere in this stack of things, so there's another one of those Grunalia. Um, so a bunch of these grew now here, actually. They're all over the place in the slide. Here's something we haven't seen before tonight. We've seen it before on streams. This is an amphora. Uh, that is both valves of the amphora. And amphora have, uh, when they have both valves present, you can see that their raphes are on the same side. So everything's in focus all at once. And then, uh, and then there's the other side that has no raphes. But that's actually one valve and the other valve. We're looking at it in girdle view. Um, and it, it's because it's shaped like uh, a loaf of bread and it's on its uh, curved side of the bread. So we're looking at the bottom of the bread loaf, basically. Um, <laughs> uh, Rams Reef asked, have I, yeah, Amphora like the jug. It's like a two mouth jug. That's, that's where it got its name from, uh, Iopta. Good, good observation, the Greek, uh, Greek urns or whatever that have two mouths. So Amphora, because both of the raphe are on the same side uh, which is a usual, unusual for diatoms, uh, where you have two valves and the raphes are visible at the same time. So, um, have you ever been called the Bob Ross of diatoms? I get called that about once a week um, when I get new stream, uh, when I'm streaming and get a new person that comes in um, that uh, says something about my voice um, or about the fact that I'm um, uh, pretty calm most of the time. Um, Amanda, you have a good night and thanks for hanging out with us. Um, you know, normally I'm bugging you on your stream, so um, thanks for hanging out here, and uh, it's good to see you. Um, uh, let's see. I know there's a bunch of stuff up here I still haven't caught, but that's okay. Um, like I said, just uh, just hit the Discord. So, uh, Tur Turbop Slayer Turbop Slayer uh, says, uh, "What is this? We're looking at a diatom in a microscope. This is the microscope." This is the camera that's showing you the picture of the diatom we're looking at. And this is Amphora. I believe the, that's the genus name of the diatom. Diatoms are a type of algae that make a silica cell wall. Um, so they, it's looking at a single-celled organism's uh, skeleton. And uh, they're microscopic in size. This one is about um, uh, 10, 2, 20, 25 microns long. Oh, we got a new subscription. Thank you. Oh. Anonymous Gifter gave uh, Amanda a tier one sub. Cool. Now she can spam those uh, false colored diatoms. So she'll be excited by that. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, the, this, the, um, what was that question you were asking? <laughs> oh, another, another sub. Constababble got a tier one sub. Excellent. Uh, maybe they're just claiming them now. Um, uh, very relaxing and informative. Yeah, that's that's how I roll most of the time. Uh, I try to keep things pretty calm. And, you know, I'm drinking chai tea and it's like one in the morning here now. So I can't get too excitable because I've got a daughter who's trying to sleep. And my wife's probably asleep by now, too. So. And my chai tea is definitely cold. Because uh, I've been talking the whole time. Um, what's the question that I missed from? Oh, uh, they have you on your stream all the time. 
Oh, dinoflagellates, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dinoflagellates sometimes eat the diatoms, right? Um, here's an example of some more of these. Um, oh, there's some more subs happening. A bunch of subs are sneaking in. Some crafty anonymous gifters giving away subs all the time. Oh, do, do, do you want to see something cool? Like, our house is just filled with diatom stuff. This is a mug that I'm drinking out of. It was one of my favorite mugs. It's, a, it's the North American Diatom Symposium mug from 2013. that happened in Bar Harbor, Maine. And, uh, and my colleague, Jasmine Saros, Dr. Jasmine Saros, who's the uh, Associate Director for the Climate Change Institute at Maine, um, is a diatomist. And uh, see, you see how they made the diatoms into a little lobster? I don't know if you can see that very clearly, right? It's like a navicula, and then they put little lobster claws on it because it's in Maine. And they do this um, at the diatom meetings, which are um, every two years. And the next diatom meeting is happening here. Not in my living room, I hope, uh, but uh, here in Terre Haute, and I'm the host. So I've got to figure out something iconic about Indiana that I can turn diatoms into and stick on the mugs. Um, so uh, uh, I helped uh, s uh, figure out where the site was going to be for this one because I happened to be in Dr. Saros's lab at the time uh, doing, it was before I had a job. Um, well, it was actually after I had a job, but I was in her lab and then I got a job and then the meeting happened. So I helped her prep it in advance. Um, let's see. Yeah. Is anyone here from India? Oh, I have friends that are uh, diatomists that are from India that sometimes show up here um in in my stream i don't think that they're here now but it's probably like early morning for them so i wish those mug warmers worked you know um, one of my students once uh, when they graduated they gave me one of those uh it's like a mug that you can change you, it heats and uh and then you can change the temperature with your phone and uh for like you know keeping your cup warm all the time tells you the temperature you can just set the temperature with your phone it's so weird um but like i my drinks don't usually last that long it's like i get it hot i drink it hot and then it's gone so um i, I can't even use the mug because you can't put it in the microwave right and that's how i usually heat everything up so uh green dish towel says i used to have a microscope at home uh, that i bought with my allowance money it was about 200 uh, but then i moved away and i traveled a lot so you just sold it 200 dollars um, so you can get a pretty decent microscope for $200. Um, this one is considerably more than $200. This is my university microscope. And, um, this one cost us about $30,000. Um, and, uh, partly because it has this really fancy camera attached to it. This thing costs like, I don't know, $800. And then, uh, the software that runs the camera and lets you measure stuff and take pictures of things costs like two thousand dollars and you know what i just decided that my camera is better than this camera and that i don't need the software because i can just do things through obs um, but when i go bring it back to the lab i'm going to put that back onto it and then you know my students can't use my camera from home so it works out um let's see uh so mysterious and so generous hmm who could it be um, yeah, my family's pretty cool, um, especially my daughter, but also my wife's pretty cool, um, and, uh, she doesn't usually show up on my streams, but Sylvia, my daughter, usually does, so she's usually, if she hears that I'm, uh, streaming. Uh, Turbo Slayer says, can this microscope see sperms? Sure, it can. Uh, sperms are relatively large, um, pretty easy to see in a microscope, actually, but, uh, that's never happened on this microscope. That's my work microscope. So, you know, I'm going to keep my body fluids out of it. Um, interestingly enough, I only get diatoms when I don't have enough nutrients in my aquarium. Oh yeah. Um, if you have one of those like placophora or something, they usually eat the diatoms off the side. Um, and, uh, if you put your aquarium in the sunlight, um, you probably will get a bunch of diatoms growing then as well. <laughs> You appreciate my passion for diatoms. Oh, and you wish my, I only have one daughter, um, but you wish her a happy birthday. Yeah, I will um, I'll let her know. 
she actually loves it when people tell her happy birthday, even if she doesn't know who they are. So she probably would be excited when I tell her, oh, chat cheered and they got excited about your birthday and she'd probably love it. Um, she sometimes is on the streams, as I mentioned. Hey, an Amis gifter gave somebody named Diatom a, 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 a gift sub. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, whose shoes is that? Whose shoes? I don't know what you're talking about, honestly. Are there shoes? Are there shoes somewhere behind me? Um, uh, you should give them... Oh yeah, if you have, uh, if you have um, diatoms in your tank, I sometimes will take... We had some diatoms growing in the fish tank here, and uh, I took them in and processed them and mounted them. So I, I think I have them in uh, like this sort of form, like in a semi-liquid form, which is like when we're done digesting, this is what they look like. They're just like a, uh, this like mostly water and then there's a bunch of stuff at the bottom. The stuff at the bottom is actually diatoms. Um, there's enough of them there that you can actually see them. They look like a gray or, or white color. Um, let's see, uh, <laughs> Billy Galaxy Art, welcome. Um, Billy Galaxy, Galaxy Art is another streamer, so if, could you give a shout out to him? Or I guess I could try to do it, but my stuff's in the way. Uh, and Billy Galaxy Art does like, uh, um, uh, they were doing like a really cool manipulation of sort of like pre-recorded oil droplets and stuff and then playing music over top of it. So uh, it was like a old school oil drop concert uh, production, but it was all being done digitally. It was really neat. Um, you should give them a check. You should check them out. Stop in and take a look at some of their stuff, some of their streams sometimes. There's, it's uh, it's neat, and uh, there's not a whole lot of people in there, so you could get some real interaction with the actual artist, which is pretty cool too. So, you know, we make them popular, and then you can be one of those hipster people that was like, I'm the first person, or like up there in the top of people who hung out and saw all of Billy Galaxy Art stuff before it became super popular to like Billy Galaxy Art. Hey, Maui, so, uh, thank you for that subscription. Anonymous Gifter gave one to Volcano Doc. Hey, that's awesome. Uh, hey, Volcano Doc, how you doing? Did you, you did give Volcano Doc a, yeah, okay, good. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, whoops. Uh, Let's see. You can send me stuff if I want. Um, well, I might be able to look at it. Um, you can send it to my school address, which uh, you could probably find pretty easily if you look up my information or, or send me a whisper later. Um, let's see. Um, what megapixel camera do you have and would you re recommend a certain brand? Um, my camera is a 20 megapixel um, Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II and uh, you could buy it uh, it's about a thousand dollars for the body by itself without any lenses on it um, but it takes great photos it's lightweight and it's a mirrorless camera which means all the lenses are about half as big as um, everybody else's lenses that do the same thing which means it's great for travel and also if you don't like having a big heavy camera hanging around your neck um, it's a it's a great little camera um, so i actually really like it and then of course it hooks up to my um, hooks up to my microscope, which I figured out how to do relatively uh, recently. Um, and I think it does a great job of, uh, of tracking what I'm looking at. And you get a nice high resolution image. Um, I mentioned that it was a 20 megapixel camera, but it actually has a high res mode. And if you um, swap it out, which I can do by clicking a button up on here, uh, it'll actually take fix 50 megapixel images of things that aren't moving. So it just does like four sets of overlapping 20 megapixel images and turns them into one giant 50 megapixel image. And uh, it also pumps out 4K video. So um, a pretty amazing camera. And um, the, the uh, I don't know, I, I don't know that I'd recommend it for everybody, but it's actually what I... I really like my camera and um, you know if you've got a grand to dump into it or if you um, you can get them sort of like cheap either used or like new new like what do they call that like almost new 
Um, I bought mine from like an open box um, from a camera shop place uh, that I think I got it for like $900. So I actually got a big discount from what it actually sells at. Um, hey, here's that giant Gumpanema again. I think maybe it's the same one. I think I've circled back around to the same giant Gumpanema that we, this is the monster that I was looking for. Um, so that's what I would, um, I mean, I would recommend it for a microscope setting. I think it's actually really nice. So, um, what lenses do I have, uh, for my, my camera? So I can't really show it to you because well, I guess I could, it's just going to mess up your, um, your image. So it's just got like a C mount on here, right? So, um, well, it's not working very well. I'm just going to leave it on there. Oops. Maybe if I do that, it'll revert my picture. I've lost my picture somehow. Hmm. Um, so uh, anyway, the, um, the lenses that I have for it are like, uh, I've got a macro lens, a 60 millimeter, which is actually a 120 millimeter macro lens. Um, I've got an ultra wide. I've got a. Um, a wide angle lens, uh, a super telephoto lens, a telephoto lens. So like I've got stuff that I can basically take pictures of the surface of the moon with. I'm going to reconnect it. That's what I needed to do. It had lost the uh, the connection piece. So. Um, Right, so let's see. Uh, a Nikon digital SLR would work fine. Um, let's see, uh, sorry. Uh, well, it could be something new, you never know. Um, growing in fish tanks are usually kind of similar things, but if it's a saltwater tank, it could be pretty interesting. Um, oh, uh, let's see. Good night, diet thumbs. Oh, thank you. I, is it Iopita or Lopta? Thanks for all the cool questions and uh, for interacting with us here tonight. Um, yeah, it's got a C-mount on it. So it's, um, because it's mirrorless, it doesn't have anything but the C-mount. And then there's an adapter, just the, um, the magnifier reducing lens, right? So that it uh, fits onto the, um, the sensor, the camera sensor. So uh, let's see. You just got some good tea. Della, are you going to stream? Are you streaming on the other side of this? Or are you not streaming tonight? Um, I thought maybe you were going to. You got to go for a little while? OK. Um, thanks for hanging out with us, Pacific Plankton. And uh, let's see. What did you put in the slit so we were seeing various organisms? Well, what what you're seeing in the space between the objectives is a microscope lens. Uh, I mean, through the objectives here is just a slide. Um, so that's, that's all we're seeing. Um, what's on the slide, basically. Um, you thought it would be fun uh, to do film. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I have two cameras. This one will, will, it will record video, as I mentioned, in 4K. Um, and then, yeah, I can just take all kinds of, I can basically have photo, uh, photo capacity to take um, all the range of things that you could really get. Um, I've taken pictures of Saturn where you can see the moons with my super telephoto lens, and I've taken pictures of snowflakes where you can see the entire snowflake as basically the single field of view. So, um, but uh, yeah, older cameras were really expensive. Um, so 14 years ago, that's, a, that's an expensive camera um, for a 4 megapixel uh, 14 years ago. For a lot of people, the camera that you can get um, that you just have on your, on your cell phone, like if you have an Apple or one of those newer phones, um, these cameras are pretty good, but they, they're never going to replace that. Uh, they can give you high quality um, shots, but you're not going to be able to get a macro shot like that lens to hand or get a telephoto where you can take a picture of Saturn uh, with with your iPhone, unless you have a telescope that you're looking through. So, um, 
what is this that I'm showing? This is a gonfanema. It's a type of diatom. It's in girdle view. And um, it's from a, um, a water hydro plant in, in uh, Idaho that one of my friends sent me. And we can zoom in, look at it uh, very closely if you'd like. So I can use my camera's zooming power. We can get really close up into it. Uh, you can see the two valves of the diatom. And I don't think this one has a name, uh, which is part of the reason why I was looking for it. Um, I think it's a new species, and I think I found it on Twitch. Uh, and I think I found another new species also while I was streaming on Twitch on Saturday. So I actually think I found two new diatom species the other day. Um, I'm pretty sure this is a new species. Uh, I sent it off to a person who studies gonfanemoids, which uh, this um, diatom belongs to that group. And um, he said, oh, that's really interesting. And then we had a sort of a four or five email exchange and I sent him some more pictures and some SEM images. And um, my guess is that by the end of this year, we'll have described these as new species. So this one, and uh, the other one, which I don't think we've seen except for maybe briefly in girdle view. Um, I, I guess I could probably try to find it. Um, but uh, we'll probably describe them as new species. So I think that's pretty likely to happen. Um, here, let me find one of them in, um, in valve view because I have a whole bunch of... Uh, somewhere, I have a whole bunch of them that I actually have. I've marked it so I could find it again with a little magic marker that I just stuck on there so I could get it kind of close. That's right inside the magic marker. We don't want that. Put a little bit of magic marker on the slide so I could find it. Here's one. Uh, this is one in, in valve view so you could see what they actually look like. Pow. Uh, so you said, I said they look a little bit like a submarine. This is an example of one of them. And, oh, that's not a good image because I need to switch this to that. Uh, actually, probably would be better if I just switched everything over to the oil objective. Sorry, minor adjustments required. Ah, there we go. Now you can see it nice and clearly, except for I'm super zoomed in. Pow. So yeah, they look a little bit like a submarine. Um, that's not unusual for this group. Um, but they do have, if we zoom into this middle area just one more time real quick. See these two little dots right there? So there's like a rafi and a rafi coming from the other side. And there's just like two little dots off on their own. That's pretty unusual. So. Uh, that's one thing, and the other thing is it's enormous. So it's this one's like uh, that's about a hundred microns long, and um, most gonfanema sort of max out before they get that big. Um, so kind of cool. So stray. Um, oh yeah, I forgot you don't stream on Tuesdays. Uh, I thought maybe I'd be interfering with your your stream, but then I forgot what day it was. So I think that's because uh, a tiny world streamed last night and I thought she only streamed on Tuesdays and then I got confused and thought last night was Tuesday when it was Monday. So now I don't know what day it is anymore. Anyway, um, let's see. <laughs> Rune lore, any idea if we see more or less diversity of diatoms near the equator? Um, diatom diversity, most organism diversity is highest near the equator and uh, diatom diversity is most high in shallow water near the coasts of major places or anywhere there's a lot of nutrients. Um, so usually in terrestrial settings, the diversity is quite high as well. Um, I would say that generally speaking, there probably is a higher diversity in the tropics, but I would also say that right now we don't know for sure because um, we've mostly studied diatoms in North America and in Europe. And that's where most of our diatomists are and, um, and where a lot of them do their work. So part of the issue is that um, we, did, we really don't have uh, a great sense of, um, of uh, 
what the diversity is in the tropics because a lot of the places in the tropics are basically still understudied. So um, I don't know. I don't know if that helps. Uh, a Twitchathon, yeah. Um, notice the dots to equate the lines. Um, let's see. So uh, what are stri? A stri are, that's just Latin, it means stripes. So the little lines that you see that are going across this diatom are uh, stri. And uh, so like if I zoom in on the stri for these, you can actually see that they're made of um, alternating rows, what we call biseriate stries of little holes. You can't actually see the holes. So trust me, on a scanning electron microscope, you would see them. But they're, um, there's a sort of big wide band running through the middle. That's the raphe, and then the little uh, things that are coming in from the sides, the little, the little fingers or something coming around the edges, those are uh, the stri. So it just means, it means stripe. It's just a Latin word for stripe. And stria is one, striae is multiple. So it's just like a bunch of lines, basically. Yeah. Um, did I ever look at curd under the microscope? No. Uh, it's moving because my arm is moving, uh, the table. So it's not actually alive. It's in, in epoxy, so it can't move. Uh, yeah, coral triangle is a good way of thinking about it. Um, there's a whole bunch of diversity associated with the tropics. The coral, fish, uh, the amphibians and frogs are highest diversity in the tropics. The Just pick something, basically, usually has highest diversity in the tropics. For most organisms, it's because the tropics are zones of high stability, and that stability leads to high diversity. So lots of nutrients, and uh, you know, the, it's the same year-round, so they don't have to have, like, the ability to adjust to winter season and uh, summer season. They just have basically more or less the same light uh, conditions. You know, if you have ever spent any time in the tropics, if you were to spend uh, like a week in Africa or something um, in the tropical sort of mid-latitude parts of Africa, the thing that would probably freak you out the most is that uh, every night around 6 o'clock or 6.30, it's dark. Um, that's just the time, and it's that way all year round. So like uh, you know, we're used to seeing this sort of like here in the temperate regions in North America, like Indiana has like, it's dark uh, in the winter time at a certain time. And then in the summertime, it gets dark at a totally different time. That doesn't happen in the tropics. Every day is basically the same. So they do have some seasonality. Uh, it's just not the seasonality that we're used to. It's a little bit, um, a little bit more like, uh, rainy season, dry season seasonality, rather than the typical uh, components that we're used to seeing, which is like winter where it's cold and summers where it's hot, um, or like rainy springs and, uh, and falls. So this is actually kind of an interesting uh, view. So we're zoomed in super close. That's a coccinese, which is the monoraphid diatom that we saw before. That's the raphid valve but it's fragmented, so normally you'd see a whole oval, and now we don't see the whole oval. But if you look closely, what you can see is that there are little oval diatoms that have colonized the dead diatom frustule of a coccinese, and they are a different species of coccinese that actually are growing on that uh, frustule as an, um, an epiphyte. So these little guys are attached to that other valve, and they're a different genus but the same uh, or sorry same genus but different species and they're using the big one's dead body as a place to colonize and live kind of cool um, so we get the uh, the little coccinese living on the big coccinese kind of kind of neat um, i'm diatoms attack uh, you can find more about me if you wanted to look it up by scrolling down and looking at the about uh, did I complete any education in college? I'm a professor, so I've got uh, an undergraduate, a master's, and a PhD, and uh, just the PhD in diatom work. But, um, but yeah, I've got some degrees. I'm educated. This is part of my work. Um, we describe species, and um, and I use them to analyze uh, environmental conditions sometimes. And I'm a paleoecologist by trade, so. Uh, I've got some degrees. This is actually the microscope belongs to my lab. It's not mine. Um, I have my own microscope in the other room, but uh, it's not as nice as this one. So uh, don't get the illusion that I've got 
thousands of dollars to throw at a microscope because it's um, my, my university's microscope, not mine. It's uh, it's one I bought, but um, but I just use it in my lab, and I have it at home because um, it's safer for me to have a microscope that I don't have to clean off and have other people using. So right now everybody basically has their own microscope in my lab that they use so that we don't have contamination. Um, Let's see. Uh, what's the interesting, like, dendrites? I don't know what the dendrites were. Probably just some organic junk. <laughs> like a diatom hermit crab. That's a good way of thinking of it, Rune Moore. Um, they're using the dead bodies of other diatoms. The diatom frustules are often used by other organisms for lots of things. So um, that you often find diatoms getting incorporated into the valves of um, uh, tintinids and things like that. So, see this little tiny guy right here? A little thing right there that looks like a pill? That's actually a really tiny little diatom. It's, uh, uh, it's about 10 microns long and about 2 microns wide, and it belongs to That belongs to the genus Acnanthidium. It's monoraphid, so on one valve, you can actually see both valves there. If I focus through it, the other valve, the raphe disappears. So there's no raphe on that one, and there's a raphe on that one, right? You can see how they're different. One has a raphe, one has no raphe. And there's a little gap that is between them that changes size when I, uh, between the raphe ends that changes size. And then the thing that's next to it's also a fragment of a diatom. That's a little piece of a diatom. I think it's a cuckanese. Um, but this thing here is an acnanthidium, and I don't know that it has a name, but it's a really little tiny guy. Um, that's a good candidate for us to look at on the scanning electron microscope because it's a little too small for the light microscope. So a little, it gets really small, and then maybe the microscope's not good enough for it. Um, uh, actually seeing it, we'd need to get something that's a little bit better. So I should probably do that if I'm going to be zoomed in on stuff. Um, so here's another one of these rimerias. You can see both valves of the rimeria. If you're here early in the stream, I was talking about rimeria. I was actually looking for the thing that's making this. That guy right there is an Ellerbeckia, but it's just a fragment of it. And I was sort of hoping to see the whole valve. So there's a cockanese. Both valves are present. That's the big one that was colonized by the little ones. Grunawia, everywhere Grunawia. And... Maybe if I zoom out, let's do that. Let's jump over to a low magnification and see if I can find, it's a lot easier to find stuff in low magnification. See if I can find us a Ellerbeckia chain. Oh, there's a little Cymbella. Don't know if Dell is here still. That's a Cymbella Mexicana. It's actually like the one I posted, not the same individual, but the same species I posted a picture of in the Discord earlier tonight. Oh, there's an Ellerbeckia right there. These little guys, I like to think of them as a stack of cookies. It's that dark thing in the middle field of view, and we're going to just get it bigger and bigger. Um, it's actually a really large diatom. It looks kind of tiny when you see it um, at 10x, but... Uh, when I get it back into the oil, you'll see it's actually a pretty big diatom. And here we go. Uh, it's a chain of diatoms. So diatoms can live in colonies, like this guy, Ellerbeckia. And uh, do you see there's sort of like a double dark line together? Each one of those double dark lines, like two sets of lines together that you're seeing there, are actually the valve faces of uh, one diatom, and so the next double band would be the next diatom, and the things that are between them, in this case, um, are, you know, the insides of the valves. So you can actually see a whole chain of diatoms here. So this would be like one, two, three, four, I think there's four and a half. 
uh, diatom valves there and they just grow together in these long chains and then their faces have sort of like a velcro structure between them Let's see if I can get up close in one of those sort of velcro structure type things um, in here by zooming in you go they look like little poker chips uh poker chip margins between them can you see that uh at the top up there uh where there's sort of like a zigzag one way like a zipper um they kind of zipper together and so that's the separation between one diatom and the next along that zippered interface so uh I love the click sound when I change magnifications. Yeah, it's a good sound. Um, it looks a little bit like a bamboo. Hey, Mama Bon Bon, how you doing? It's good to see you here. So, um, yeah, these are uh, Ellerbeckia. This is Ellerbeckia. It's probably um, Arenaria. That's the name of the species. Ellerbeckia is the genus name. And this is just a long stack of them. So we sometimes see Ellerbeckia in Pacific Plankton's marine um, samples when we're looking at those, the, the live versions of these diatom cells with the chloroplast still in them. Um, but they're not this species. There are different species, Ellerbeckia sole, which is a marine diatom. This is a freshwater diatom. But um, I was telling people on the stream on Wednesday that um, Ellerbeckia is another one of these species that tells me that there was um, it was probably water flowing over rocks because they live in um, like wet cave walls or in um, waterfalls, like places where there's water flowing over um, rocky material that they can attach to. And um, like if you have uh, a drain spout on the side of a building that, um, that's broken off and you just have it dripping down the side of the building, when it rains, these things will bloom basically on the sides of buildings sometimes. So um, it's like an example of how you can match the diatom with a very specific type of environment. So if I were to do, like, which Anna gave me this sample, I'd never seen it, the collection site before, I had no idea where it was she collected it, and I was able to basically piece together that it was flowing water, that there were rocky substrates nearby, like a waterfall of some type, and, um, and that... Um, uh, that the uh, high flowing water with relatively low nutrients and um, I did all of that like totally blind and then later on I asked her what the sample was from and she said oh it's from a, a power plant where it's right next to a waterfall so every part of what I had guessed was actually exactly right um, and that's one of the reasons why I like studying diatoms so much is because I can use them I know enough about their ecology to actually use them to tell okay, I knew this is a water sample. I know exactly what kind of environment these things represent. And the group of them together basically gives me like a family portrait of what kind of environment these things have to come from. And you have to realize that the, it's an assemblage. So these things aren't living all at the same time. Some of them are dead. Some of them are transported in. But um, you can basically put yourself in that landscape mentally and you can actually figure out what kind of environment it was. Even completely unseen so i never never had any idea from her like what the site was or anything um, she just gave it to me and i basically reconstructed what the environment is based on what i knew about diatoms um, which is kind of a lot but um, it's that sort of process that basically allows me to figure it out and then when i asked her hey where's this come from she's like oh it's a it's a power plant and then i looked it up there's like this rocky waterfall right in front of the power plant i was like um every part of what i determined was true and um people are often fascinated with the pa the capacity to do that i'm like a little wizard right like i can tell you oh this thing lives in these conditions i found this so it has to be lumped together with these things because there's something like this there so roycosphenia we saw we saw um a bunch of that grunawia everywhere we saw uh rimeria and we saw this ellerbeckia and they're the dominant things that we see and they're lumped together with those giant gomphonies and uh, gonfanema, which I know represent flowing water again. So I basically could piece together a rocky environment, flowing water, um, and all of those components, totally sight unseen, right? Totally no idea, and then ask somebody, and they're like, yes. So that's what I like about it. It's cool. You can just basically figure things out. So 
Um, are they attached solely via Velcro structure or do they secrete an adhesive? There's some organic component that's also helping to hold them together, um, rune lore. But for these particular group, um, Ellerbeckia, they have um, what are called cameo and intaglio um, type structure, which is really like Velcro, where they like interlink, like one side is grooved and the other side has gaps and they fit together like a puzzle piece. And it's really hard to separate them, which is why we often find them in these sort of long, like cigarette stick shaped colonies, right? Where, you, where they're together. Um, so there's a physical connection, but then they also usually secrete a little mucus between them to kind of help hold them together. So, um, yeah, that's the general concept for them. Uh, you know, like what I do is paleo environmental reconstruction using these, um, using these as a tool. So here's Rikosphenia, as I mentioned, that's a flowing water indicator. Uh, that's Grunaui, another flowing water indicator. This is uh, more Grunaui, so it's like the whole thing is filled with Grunaui. And uh, we saw a bunch of Rikosphenia earlier. We saw a bunch of, um, uh, we saw some, uh, a few cases of Rimeria and those really large uh, Gumphonema. And then these things, which I mentioned that we saw, which was a bunch of Cockneys, that are here, um, they usually grow on plants. So it indicates that there's shallow water nearby with a bunch of plants. So I'm assuming they're probably aquatic plants that are growing in the waterfalls or adjacent to the waterfalls on the rocks and these things are attached to those. So pretty good uh, interpretation skills. And we don't see much of anything else except for these little tiny ecnanthes that are in ecnanthidiums that are in here, which are you know, not very indicative of anything. They're kind of like weeds. Um, they grow everywhere where there's um, where there's space for them to get away with it, basically. So, um, you know, in most cases, they don't tell you anything. Maybe at the species level, we could use it to tell us something particular about the nutrient status of the system, or sometimes they only grow in flowing waters or something like that, but it's usually like a species level. So I think somebody was asking me about these dendritic, uh, dendritic shapes. I, I think they meant like this. These are probably... Um, these are probably just pieces of organic matter. Um, some of the really large gumphonemas actually create stalks that look something like this. Um, so it could be some organic matter that's excreted as EPS from, from some so no, Mr. Horologist is raiding with a party of 113. Oh my God, Mr. Horologist, what are you doing? Uh, how was your stream? Hopefully it was going quite well. Uh, this is the second monster stream that we've had in a row. And I was getting to the point where I was like, oh, I've been going for a long time. I should find somebody to raid. Um, but I, I can stick around for a little while if you're going to raid me with a monster pile of viewers. And then uh, I'll just stay up a little bit later. It's not a big deal. Um, right now we're looking at some diatoms that we found in sample that was sent to me by my friend Anna from uh, a power plant uh, where they just collected some water. Um, from the water to test, I think the water quality is what they were looking at when they sent it to her. Um, they were mostly looking at the algae and then there was a bunch of diatoms in it. And um, I'm excited by this particular sample because I think we found two new species uh, that we're probably going to describe sometime this year or next year um, just by accident. Uh, she sent me the sample and said, hey, there's a big diatom in here. I don't know what it is and um, could you take a look at it? And I said, sure. And then I went looking for it on my stream on uh, Saturday, and I thought I didn't find it because I couldn't find something that I, that I thought matched it. And then I got home, and I looked closely at the SEMs, and I was like, I actually think this is the right one. Um, so, And then in the process of looking at it very closely, I realized there was actually two species in there, not just one. Uh, and then I showed both of them to somebody who's an expert with these things. And they were like, hey, I think there's two new species in here. And uh, so we'll likely describe two new species. So uh, Mr. Horologist looks at, uh, he repairs watches on, uh, on, on Twitch during his stream. He usually has a large number of viewers. So probably everybody here already knows um, what he's up to, but um, you should definitely check him out if you don't. Um, like Mr. Horologist, we look at really tiny things. He's got these like, uh, He's got like a whole set of like little tiny tweezers and things he's picking up the uh, the pieces with and uh, I don't I don't have any of those tools here at home where I pick up stuff but um, sometime in the next week or two I'm gonna do a stream where we actually use a micro manipulator yeah 
Um, uh, and I'm going to stream, I think, from the micro manipulator. So I have a stereo microscope, and then uh, I'm going to uh, use the micro manipulator to pick up diatoms and put them down uh, somewhere else. So I'm going to actually like pick them up and move them from one place to another and reposition them using a tiny little device with gears that can be used to uh, manipulate very small things. So the diatom that we're looking at in this field of view is Grunauia, and there's some cockneys here and another cockneys down here. I mentioned that I'd measured these a little bit earlier, and I think this, uh, this cockneys here is smaller than the one we were looking at, but it's in the same group. It's about 40 microns in size, so uh, this Rikosphenia that's next to it is also probably about 30 microns long or something like that. Um, pretty cool. So we're going to pick up little tiny things and try to manipulate them, but uh, I can guarantee you that I won't be able to do nearly as cool stuff like, you know, build and repair watches from it. Um, no, this isn't a new one. Uh, these are known species. That's Cocconese, I think, lineata and Rikosphenia curvata. So I think those are both uh, known species. And that's Grunauia. I don't remember what the species name. It's somewhere in the stream previously, but I actually looked it up before. And there's another little uh, Cocconese in here. I think that's Neo um, And uh, But the species that's new, the genus that's, species that's new that's in here, there's two of them. One is a Gomphonese and the other is a Gomphonema, which are sort of asymmetric, long, very large diatoms. Um, uh, the species are not always the sometimes the these species are but this the genera are not always as giant as these ones are so I was referring to them as gumful monsters because they're like twice the size of a normal normal gumphonema um, so they're kind of interesting but one of the things that happens when you look at uh, when you're looking at a bunch of really small things is when you have some of the bigger small things they're usually a kind of rare so that's a, a pattern that's pretty common. So the really big things that I was looking for were actually a bit of a hunt. We had to go like through the whole sample and find just a couple of them. Um, and then I also noticed that I was looking at unprocessed material when I normally process them. And, uh, and that actually limited my views that I wanted to see. So um, earlier tonight, I had my grad st uh, undergrad student uh, in the channel, Rihanna, and uh, before the stream, she had been in the lab and added nitric acid to the samples. So tomorrow I'm going to have to rinse out the nitric acid. Um, here's some Rikosphenia curvata as well. Hey, my battery on my camera is going out. Um, so the, uh, uh, you can see them in their life position. That stuff that's at the base down there is a little bit of um, EPS, which is basically just a polysaccharide that, um, that they... Uh, squeeze out through their foot poles and these would have been attached by that to some substrate so the two of them are living in a little colony attached by their feet to their foot pole which is the skinny side kind of cool um, oh, there's so many people that followed me tonight I can't even keep up with it it's just amazing um, two giant raids will do that I suppose uh, as an entertainment I should even just try to read through this list of, uh, of new followers and we had a ton of gift subs that came in and we had a bunch of cheering that happened uh, so it's been a pretty amazing night um, I, I haven't streamed at night for a long time and uh, like maybe three weeks and this is a good uh, welcome back so um, uh, let's see where were we two hours ago when I started the stream we got follows from Ardent Candle, another stream, uh, another follow from D Harma, um, two chooks with the cheer, respect. We had a giant raid from Paleontologizing, brought 99 people into the channel. Then uh, followed by Draco, Knife, Spoony, Zool, uh, Callower, who I guess I'm friends with on uh, Twitch now, Rune Lore, who's here in the channel with us now, I believe, um, A Pascal. Neo Boothus, uh, coordination, coordination. Oh, uh, Dzelt, uh, little Bigfoot. Hey, we were looking for like a cryptid, so little Bigfoot. That's a good name for our stream. Uh, we're looking for a cryptid diatom though. Um, SPD game, tactical sponge, dicer, uh, lopta or iopta. I don't know if that's an I or an L. 
um, a, a carbonaceous 14, that's a cool name. Uh, Dr. Robotnik, what a cool name. Um, Astrato, and then we had a giant uh, set of community gift subs where somebody gave out 20 of them like all at once, which was cool. Um, Cor Sertoy, uh, somebody named Jay with a bunch of numbers in front of it. Gremlin Weekend, ZZ Chops, like ZZ Tops, I believe. Uh, and then uh, Carlos, we had a raid from Garden Outside. Lead Wind, Baking Bunny, Rams, Reef. I mean, it feels like I'm just making a, a, up a bunch of names, but there really are that many people that followed. Um, Happiest Collie, I guess their dog's very happy. Rams Reef with a 300-bit uh, a cheer. Some more gift subs that came in from an anonymous gifter. Uh, Turbop Slayer, who I think is still in the channel with us now. Um, Cyber Prime Primal, Pizza Come Pizza. Watts Wheelhouse and then Mr. Horologist with his giant raiding party of 113 people. So thank you for that raid. Uh, new follows from that group came in. Changeling Thing, Just Jewels, uh, R.J. Helms, Reint Lion, uh, 14 Leon, Prince Kiowski, Jerkling, You He Dad, and Kerball, and somebody named uh, Giraffe with a four in it. Uh, the most recent follows that it's just like a monster list of people i want to thank all of you for the follows and um hopefully we got some some pretty cool stuff yes yeah, sticky sugary goo is eps that's what they squeeze out i don't have to worry about the battery uh you know worst case scenario and uh you know like the camera battery dies i've got two more of them over there that are fully charged i'll just disappear for a second and come back and then and then we'll have uh we'll have batteries again If I go streaming for too much longer, I'll get another giant raid and then I won't be able to, you know, I'll just be stuck here for the rest of the night looking at uh, diatoms. Mind of a snail. Uh, did somebody give her a shout out? They did. Okay. Uh, there's two of them. The two snails. Two, two minds and two snails. Um, you should check out Mind of a Snail. They, they uh, play music and do puppeteering, and I think they're going to be on uh, Peachops' stream uh, in, in his underground, underwater lair um, later this week. That's what I heard. And I'm excited about that because, um, you know, I was talking to Peachops, and I was, like, talking to Mind of Snail, and I was like, you guys should, like, talk because you got cool stuff that overlaps. And you guys should also check out that um, Billy Galaxy art that was here before. Um, I feel like maybe uh, Peachops and Mind of a Snail would really appreciate Billy Galaxy Arts uh, stuff. So another uh, person they might want to consider in their uh, psychedelic streams that they do. Pretty cool stuff. Um, Sarah, uh, Sarah, thanks for uh, shouting out my Instagram. If you want to see some pictures from the scanning electron microscope, you can check that out. Um, is this Flint, Michigan public water samples? No. Um, there's no lead in our sample as far as I can tell. Um, but thank you for bringing up the Flint, Michigan water crisis. That's um, uh, something that I focus on as an environmental scientist, and I feel like um, we've let that story sort of fall by the wayside, but there's still people in Flint, Michigan that are still kind of suffering a bit by uh, the lack of clean water. Um, they still haven't got that thing completely sorted, and it was a long time ago that it was a problem. It's like most environmental problems we... Um, we don't solve them. We just like, we gave them some water for a little bit and then people donated some money and then sometimes they get fixed and a lot of times they don't, but it, uh, people get tired of hearing about it and they just move on. Um, but, uh, I never move on. I'm still worried about those people. Um, do guys grow, do these guys grow like a cone like shell, like a mollusk? No, uh, they do not. So diatoms will, um, polymerize the silica all at once. Um, they start to form like the major structures and then they build outward from those major structures and then uh, the diatom valve is complete so uh, snails grow like uh, like every year they add a little bit to the previous layer and um, and then uh, the snail gets bigger and bigger through time that doesn't happen with diatoms they start with a rigid structure which is the cell wall and uh, they can make new ones as we talked about earlier in the stream by um, just expanding it a little bit and growing inside and then uh and then creating you know like by binary fission by splitting into two um so they can do that but they can't uh, they don't grow they don't uh, they don't get bigger through time in fact they just replicate uh and then usually replication makes them get smaller so <laughs> you believe me this time okay good 
Um, let's see. Uh, I've got more batteries, yeah. I know, it's, but I don't have any classes tomorrow. Well, I'm like, I'm sitting in on a class tomorrow, but it's like a lab time, and uh, it's in late in the day, and um, I'm doing a little SEM training in the morning uh, with another student, a grad student that uh, needs to use the scanning electron microscope, and um, and I'll probably do a stream tomorrow afternoon. So like, uh, and I don't have a lot of prep to get done tomorrow for Thursday. So staying up late, it's not a big deal. I'm usually up till two every day. Even I'm usually working until like at least one o'clock. And then I need like a little bit of like, just a little bit of time where I'm not totally like writing another lecture or something else. So um, yeah, but uh, understandable if other people want to go to sleep eventually, you know, I kind of need it eventually too. Um, and I'm pretty fast on the battery switch out because the battery opening is right here. I can just pop, pop, and then it's over. You know, you'll, you won't even notice it. You'll just be like, whatever. Um, it's always fun hanging out with Mind of a Snail. And Mind of a Snail, like I will sometimes give them some images that they'll use in their puppeteering scheme. So um, pretty cool. Uh, working together on the lair. Yeah, on Thursday. That's going to be amazing. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's not uh, trendy anymore, so nobody cares about it. So yeah, we just sweep it under the rug. I was actually, um, I'm teaching a, a class on environmental geology uh, this semester, and I was talking today about all of the, uh, it's a, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, the the um, uh, Horizon uh, oil, oil spill in the Gulf, and the fact that, um, you know, that we worried about those for a little while and then supposedly they're cleaned up. But then if you go back to those beaches in Alaska from 30 years, basically, um, where the oil spills happened, there was like a thousand miles or 1300 miles along the beaches of, um, the Gulf of Alaska, where the oils, um, from that spill from the Exxon Valdez spill basically contaminated the soils and, uh, killed off all the fish and the birds and everything else that are up there. Um, and they cleaned off the beaches by having to like spray them down and, and they washed all the ducks that they could find or whatever in the buckets with the soap and shit. But like when it gets right down to it, if you go back to those beaches and you dig, dig down like, um, you know, maybe 30 centimeters into the beach, what you find is that it stinks like oil. There's still oil in that environment and it hasn't disappeared. We've cleaned up the surface, but it's like literally swept it under the rug we got rid of what was on the top and then it's like you know like the kind of people who uh just clean the surface of something and then it, it never flip it over to clean the other side that's what we did um so like it's been 30 years the still the, the environments are still destroyed and the salmon that are in those environments that they've mostly come back but they are are consuming things that basically eat or eat or live in those oil rich environments so um Anyway, just as a, um, I'm on my, uh, I got on a soapbox there for a bit, which I don't normally do, but environmental problems like that are usually things that we just ignore after a while. So they're really problems, uh, serious problems. And then, um, you know, we have some real heartfelt, like it's terrible, uh, this situation's terrible, but like we never actually fix them, right? They're still going on. Um, let's see. You're helping out with classes tomorrow. You're going to miss my stream. It's okay. Uh, we'll manage. I mean, I got other moderators, but you can always catch uh, the videos on demand. So, uh, your son, you, you got your son a uh, cheap little USB microscope off of Amazon for fun, and he absolutely would love this. Well, you should uh, have your son check out my scanning electron microscope streams. Uh, it costs considerably more than a USB microscope, um, and it'll be on tomorrow from 1 until 3 in the Eastern time, um, or you can catch some of my old uh, videos on demand. But I actually usually like to keep my streams really clean. I mean, I know I said sometimes I say a, a swear word now and then, but I would say relative to most of the other people that are on Twitch, um, I try to use uh, no harsh language just in case there are kids watching. So uh, your five-year-old son could probably watch almost everything that we've put out and be totally fine um, with the with these streams. And also the old stuff is also archived on YouTube. So if you wanted to show them the YouTube stuff, it's also out there. So it's amazing you can reconstruct past climate change through diatoms. Um, have uh, psychrophilic diatoms ever told us anything about times that ice ages in the past? Yes. 
um, uh, lots of things have been uh, associated with diatoms that grow in colder conditions. So for example, in the marine realm uh, off the coast of Antarctica, diatoms are tracking, there's diatoms that grow in the ice, that actually live in the frozen surface uh, of the ice. And when they die, uh, and they're no longer in the water column, because the ice melts, they leave a record in the sediments that are right below the ice shelf. And every year the ice changes its position, it grows outward and shrinks, and people will collect cores from uh, the sediments, and they can actually tell when the ice sheets had been larger and had expanded over places uh, farther away, and when the ice sheets contract and they don't reach out as far, those uh, cold-loving diatoms that you're talking about, the, the, um, uh, the psychrophilic type, the, the like really cold conditions, they will, um, they'll not be present, right? So they tell you that the ice shelf was never that far out, and they can use that, tie it together with a chronology to figure out how old it was in time, and they can actually see how the ice shelf has moved through time. So there's an example of expanding contraction of an ice sheet associated with glacial periods and colder periods. That would give us a pretty good indication. Oh, here's a diatom we haven't seen yet. A new one. That is an that is one we haven't seen at all. It looks like it's a tiny little cymbella. Um, so that's an example of a, uh, a one example of how you could use it in those settings. Um, in terrestrial settings, it's a little bit more challenging. So that's a, your question, Rune Lore, um, because when the glaciers expand in terrestrial settings and the continental ice sheets expand, they, they act like a giant bulldozer and they basically scrape the whole landscape clean. And that includes all the sediments and all the records that we have. And so, um, you know, they basically remove the record from those areas. And then when the glacier retreats, they make new lakes. So we can tell from cold loving diatoms that the early parts of the record are basically the pioneering species that like cold water, low nutrient conditions will, um, um, will start in that setting. And then gradually as the environment gets warmer, they get replaced. So that's a, an example of how you could use them in like terrestrial settings. It's a little harder though, because usually in terrestrial settings, the glaciers basically just remove the, uh, the entire landscape. They get rid of lakes, they get rid of all the old sediments. They just bulldozer all of the sediments out of, um, of the valleys and places where they are. So it's a little more challenging. Um, let's see. Uh, macro remediation is the only remediation that looks good on TV. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't watch TV anymore. That's a, yeah. Uh, they made it look pretty, but then nothing to help. Yeah. They basically cleaned up the, the, uh, yeah, there's still oil saturated soils all over Alaska. There's still tar balls coming up from deep water horizon. Um, you know, on the beaches in Texas, there's, there's still, like today, uh, saturated oil, saturated soils. So yeah, and the, that is true. We do, we don't charge. Uh, I mean, if you look at how much taxes oil companies pay, it's zero every year. Um, so they basically we're paying them to clean up the mess they made. Um, you know, it's a pretty serious problem. But we uh, we're addicted to oil, and until we get off of it as a um, as an energy source, when we can, until we can afford to do it, and until we can manage to like build the industry infrastructure to actually do it, um, it's a necessary evil because we need energy. But uh, we could definitely be working harder at um, at removing ourselves from that situation. Just that we don't, because we're lazy and we're short-sighted as a as a whole. Political power is usually a short-term gain, and not long-term objectives and that's the real critical issue and until we get there we're still going to need uh we're going to need fossil fuels for a while but um my little diatomist sometimes plays minecraft yeah we haven't had a minecraft stream for so long uh sylvia's just been like not uh not concerned about streaming which is okay i don't necessarily need her to but uh she used to be really really excited um clean up to shut up. Yeah, that's basically what we do. Get them like, so it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, pandemic watch, like an old globe I bought showing the uh, greater Antarctic sea ice shelf. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Oh, what did I miss about Minecraft? I feel like there was a Minecraft comment that I missed somewhere. Okay. Um, it's cool to sometimes just hang out and play Minecraft, or we sometimes, in my uh, Discord, we just hang out and watch some people play games and, uh, and chat over top of it. It's nice. If you want to hang out sometime, you can still hang out and do that, even if you're not playing. Um... Uh, we get naturally occurring tar balls in California beaches seasonally, and that's true even in Texas, and uh, I don't think it's as true in, in um, Alaska, but, um, you know, there are natural seeps of oil that generate tar balls. Um, they can do really cool things with tar balls. They can send them off to labs and then chemically fingerprint them, and um, if it's a, a known oil spill, the, um, the chemicals the actual like uh, petroleum chemicals leave uh, a fingerprint and they can use that to track whether a tar ball represents a, a natural seep of, um, of oil or natural gas or whatever, um, or whether it's associated with a specific oil um, uh, a spill in the past. And they can actually link them together and figure it out. And um, in Texas, for example, they have a whole... Um, a beach watch, yeah. They have a whole like uh, uh, government institution that basically goes through and looks at it um, and checks to see whether you know somebody finds a bunch of tar balls. They'll chemically fingerprint it, and then um, if it's a if it's tar ball associated with an actual oil spill, then the oil spill gets fined, or they they have to come clean up the tar balls. And if they're natural, they just go, oh well, it's a natural one. But they can figure it out, um, so that's kind of cool. It's not just like a mystery, like, oh, some of them are natural and some of them aren't. Um, you can tell which ones basically are the natural ones um, chemically. So kind of cool. You have a protocol for collecting them too. That's cool. Um, <laughs> assume you know the correct arguments to unpack those tar balls. Yeah. Uh, it's important to know, like, uh, there's also tar ball is a... Uh, I think it's like a computer terminology too, but uh, we mean the ones that occur on beaches, not the ones that occur in uh, in files. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like I've uh, almost just been chatting and not uh, not looking at any diatoms, but uh, there's sort of a limit to how many how many diatoms because we're looking at the same samples. Uh, we can find some cool specimens like. Is one of these monster gomphonemas. Oh, that one's actually gomphonese. Um, this is the other new species right here. You're seeing it live on Twitch from my microscope. This is an unknown species. Uh, it's closely related to gomphonese mamilla, but uh, it is not gomphonese mamilla as far as we know. And um, this one I like to call the horned beast because the horned beast has little horns at the top. Uh, I don't know if you can see them. That's the head pole. And way up on the head pole is sort of like a little fork-shaped structure. And it actually has two little spines that are growing off the front end of it. And we could see it in the stream on the SEM images pretty clearly, but in the light microscope, it's actually kind of hard to see it. They're just two little bright spots right up there at the top. Um, but they're actually sticking up together like goat horns off the front end of it. Uh, pretty cool. Um, that's how I know that it belongs with Gomphonese mamilla, because um, Gomphonese mamilla is basically the only Gomphonese with horns, and then it's got the stigma that's here in the middle, and it's dry or dense and shaped similar to mamillas. They're, um, they're biseriate again, this double punctate with the uh, alternating holes in them. So, and then like our other giant, our other gomphonemoid uh, type diatoms, if I go down to the foot pole and look closely at it, um, this one just looks like, uh, it just looks like a pore field's really barely visible. Um, it's like clear almost, but uh, um, when we look at this on the stream tomorrow, I'm sure I will see some of these. That little pore field is made up of a whole bunch of little tiny holes like a salt and pepper shaker that you can't see in the light microscope, but you, even with the best microscopes, you can't see it, but, um, or maybe you can see kind of a trace of it with mine, but, um, you know, zooming in's not gonna help. We still aren't gonna be able to see those holes very well. 
um, but in the light microscopes, you, you're never going to see them really. Um, I can get you closer, but it doesn't mean you're going to resolve it any better because the wavelength of light's kind of restricted. But you can kind of see them right there. See the little tiny holes? That's about as good as you're going to get. Uh, you know, we're super zoomed in on a really good microscope. Um, but uh, scanning electron microscope, we'll be able to see those very clearly. Yeah, you can see them. It's like one of those, like, squint right. You can kind of see there's bright spots in there that are speckling that surface. But um, you wouldn't be able to see that on, like, you know, a lower grade microscope without the uh, camera enhanced zoom like just seeing it like this you probably would barely be able to see them even if I took a picture um, probably it wouldn't come out very clear so this is probably a new species and we're working on we're gonna work on describing it I've gonna try to image some of it tomorrow on the SEM and then I'm gonna try to get some more light microscope images of it as well and do some measurements of the populations and um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think your microscope would be able to see it. Um, oh, you want me to do the trick by... I can do that. So um, I can do a little bit of um, manipulation of the light associated with these um, apical pore fields. If I zoom in, we were seeing them kind of refracted right here, right? Um, you can do a trick, which is basically distort the light by putting your finger down here and it changes, the light kind of wraps around my finger and you can probably see those little pores a little bit better. So um, in the old days, you can also do it with like a pencil if you don't want to put your finger in there. Um, or I'm using a Sharpie, but you can just put that in between the light and the, the uh, objective and uh, it creates these sort of shadows and the light wraps around the um, obstruction and uh, creates oblique lighting, right? So we can get some oblique lighting in here, and actually then some of those little pores will stand out a bit better, right? You can maybe see them a little bit better. So it's a good idea, Pacific Plankton. Um, it's pretty cool. So like puppetry, a little tiny puppet, um, uh, but the old school microscopists would do that. Another thing I could do if I really wanted to get it visible is this uh, oil drop between my cover slip and the uh, objective. But um, in the old days, they would actually also put an oil drop on the condenser. And uh, really, if I wanted to get um, a good image of that, what I would do is also put a drop of oil on the condenser on the underside and create a continuous column of, you know, like oil, glass, oil, glass with no air. And it would improve the brightness and I'd actually be able to see a little bit more detail. Old microscopists, they knew this and, um, and they would do it. But um, most modern... Uh, diatomists are too lazy to do it, um, we, you know, because you got to clean up the condenser and it makes a mess, and uh, and uh, it can be really messy, especially like in my students. I don't ever try to uh, have them do it because uh, they have a hard enough time just putting like a little drop of oil on there and not making a big pool of uh, an oil spill on my microscopes. So uh, definitely don't want them putting it on the condenser. I'd have oil like all the way down inside of everything. Um, <laughs> Immersion oil, yeah. Uh, these are like immersion oils. Um, I'm Immersol, but uh, you know the minerals aren't floating in the oil like those are. But uh, we've got refractive indus in the epoxy here that makes the diatom stand out a little bit better, which is what those immersion oils from uh, mineralogy class, what they were trying to do is make different minerals stand out by using the refractive indices to give uh, highlight certain components. We're doing that, um, right? same kind of thing um anyway uh yeah some of the pores in the SEM are nearly circular perforations you'll see that um old school microscopists didn't have twitch and they got bored and played with stuff <laughs> um uh, i don't think twitch keeps me from being bored uh i think it's just like i have a little opening in my day and I feel like I would like to share it with people um, so uh, they didn't have twitch though I'll get, grant you that they they, uh, they really didn't have ways of communicating with uh, the world but you can see those biseriates stride pretty nicely now right you can see that they are alternating little holes on the surface of that thing uh, the this is a group's 
this belongs with the group of Gomphonese. There's like two types of Gomphonese. So Gomphonese is like a pretty weird, maybe not completely um, separated genus. And there's sort of two types. One has these um, biseriate striae, and uh, and then they have this um, something called an uh, uh, an axial line. So you can see along the length of um, of this diatom, there's sort of like a, a bright set of striae and then a darker band that separates it from the next group. And when I rotate the stage, it comes into focus right there on the bottom and the top at the same time. And that's because these types of diatoms have something called an axial plate. So there's a bit of silica that's covering over the internal costi all along that boundary. And you can see that in a scanning electron microscope. If we can get some that are like internal views, you'll see that that, that line that runs down the length of it, the axial line, is actually produced by an axial plate or a piece of silica that's like a thin membrane of silica that runs through the entire valve. And this group of Gonfanese basically have that component and the other group of Gonfanese don't have it. And so they think they probably don't belong together and they're still working on separating them. Oh, there goes my battery. So um, I'll be back in one second and then eventually we'll find a ring. That the jingling noise you heard was because uh, the um, Christmas decorations are kind of still up around the house, I guess, um, on that on that door at least. Just like that, I've got a new battery. See, easy. Uh, they recommend that I use an Olympus battery, but I'm not. The diatom that took out the camera, but I've got more cameras, so it's not a, it's not a big deal. Anyway, so that other gonfanemoid that we looked at didn't have those lateral, those long lateral lines going along the axial lines and uh, belong to a different group. But all of the gonfanemas, a uh, gonfanese, have something called a uh, pseudocepta. So when we look at, the, um, at the, the focal height where the surface is in focus, we can see the striae really well. Um, but if I actually start to focus through the diatom, there's like a... Uh, right there, you can see sort of like a thickening at the top, and then there's sort of a dark line uh, that's inside of that thickened part. And um, that's actually a piece of plate of silica that's at a different focal height. So you can deconstruct what the inside of the valve looks like even without an SEM using a light microscope and a little bit of optical dissection, uh, dissection where we can basically separate individual planes out and figure out like what was going on. So that septa or pseudoscepta um, becomes visible at that elevation and then it's not visible when we're looking at the surface but you can see the axial plate or the appearance of those uh, lot of axial lines running down the, the valve okay yeah optical dissection that's what i do um right so this is our uh, horned beast uh Gumphanese. and uh, like i mentioned this is probably a new species or maybe a variety of uh, mamilla. So we'll probably end up describing that guy. I'm excited that I bumbled into it. Um, I didn't have it marked anywhere on the slide, so I just randomly came across that one. Some plant cells, another cockanese. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's all. I think that's all the cool stuff that I have in the slide, actually. I think we've seen everything. So. Um, why don't we see if there's anyone left around that we could raid, and then I can call it an evening. Does that sound good? Um, you know, we've had such a great evening full of uh, visitors and guests, and we've had a bunch of raids, and um, we got a bunch of good science in. Uh, got to hang out with my friends Del Maximum and Pacific Plankton and Constababble and um, Amanda slash Frecht Chemist and... Uh, 
Volcano Doc is here with us as well, and Mind of a Snail, just like a huge long list of, I don't want mean to leave anybody out, but we've got a, a big giant list. Uh, hey, Consta Bevel is actually streaming right now, so we could hop over and raid her. I think that's actually a good idea. Um, and I hope everybody who came in uh, had a fun time with uh, with what we came up with here. Uh, you check us out tomorrow around 1 to 3 Eastern time, and I'll be streaming from the scanning electron microscope. We'll be looking at the same samples, so we'll be able to see a lot of the same stuff. She'd appreciate it. Oh, she's got a comedian on. Okay, cool. Well, it sounds great. We could um, just pass around the community between um, people that I view as friends. So it would be great to be able to do that. Um, and hopefully you'll stick around and, uh, and check out um, Constababble. So let's see. I'm going to hit the raid command. Constababble. It's hard for me to type around. Let's see if I got it right. I don't see it showing up, so maybe I didn't. I'll steal the one that Pacific Plankton used. Nope. It did not. That one worked. Okay. Thank you everybody for hanging out with me tonight. And hopefully uh, you enjoyed learning a little bit about diatoms and um, got uh, uh, some quality time in with uh, good friends. And um, if you wanted to hang out some more, you could always join my Discord. Um, or you could check out some of the things that I take pictures of there or uh, hang out with us when we game. Oh, and I threw a little um, uh, tardy bee on there. Uh, to say goodbye with. So um, hopefully everybody has a great night and maybe we'll catch you tomorrow uh, in the afternoon. So um, yeah, it's the sexy tardy bee uh, that little Chook draw for, drew for us. Um, well, I think she drew it for herself, but, uh, but was inspired by tardy grades that we had on a stream here uh, previously. So um, all right, thanks everybody and um, you have a good night. I'm going to maybe get some sleep, and, uh, and then I'll see you tomorrow, maybe. All right, uh, and if not, well, we'll catch you next time. Okay.